So yeah, Fuzzbutt Gigs podcast uh, episode number two, um, and we're here with uh, Paul Vickers and the Leg, or well, Dan Much of the Leg. Uh, the Leg are normally completed by James Metcalf, John Mackey, Alan. How do you pronounce Alan's last name? Sherlock. Sherlock. Sherlock and Pete. Sherlock. Sherlock. Har- Sherlock and of course Pete Harvey. Um, so anyone listening just now will have heard um, "Wait in the Car" by the Beaters and "She's Enough Paradise" by Paul Vickers and the Leg. Um, so yeah, so first off, how are you doing today? Like, um, having a nice chill evening and stuff thus far. Well, we are, we are, we are now. Yeah, we were. I think, I think we were both kind of in the sort of lockdown blues type kind of mode a bit earlier on. <laughs> uh, I was filling in a lot of application forms for storage heaters. Um, so yeah, that wasn't really lifting my mood that much. <laughs> but I'm getting the stuff storage heating, so that's good. So. Um, but that's, that's not very rock and roll. But there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's very rock and roll. That sounds like the plot of the next uh, Mr. Twonky uh, like opus. Well, you should see Paul's flat. It's like so 
perfectly sort of suitable for Twonky. It's, it's just one big round room. Yeah, it's like the Oval Office, but, um, but with with massive windows, so it is quite difficult to heat. But yeah, very unusual, just a big big round room. It's in a windmill. So, well, what was a windmill essentially? On the Green Grocer album cover, there's like a windmill and stuff. Is that was it? Was that that inspire that, or is that just completely coincidental? Um, I've always been a bit obsessed with windmills, to be honest with you. Going going back um, to Windy Miller and stuff with the applicants, but um, I don't know why I live in a windmill. I mean, it's not really not a windmill anymore. I mean, if you, you'd have to put blades on it, and you wouldn't be able to produce a lot of grain. Probably the funny thing about that is that. Um, before uh, Paul lived in that flat, uh, me and Alan actually went in there be- t- and did some recording with a guy that lived there previously to Paul, completely randomly. Like, and uh, it's very funny because if you've ever tried recording in a round room, it's, <laughs> it's a very <laughs> strange experience. You stand on one side, well, not even one side, you stand on one little bit of the room and you hear all this bass and stuff, and then you take two steps to the next side of the room, and it, it's really tinny and stuff. It's very, very strange. Yeah, I've just worked out the EQ recently because I, well, I don't, I haven't been enjoying listening to music in my flat for quite a long time, and then recently I worked out what the EQ was for my room, and I think I've got it right now, but it took ages. Like it was like sometimes we just like you said just no bass, but now I've definitely got bass. Well, yeah. well now, now now's the time to work it out with all the extra time where everyone's been unfortunate having. Yeah, you know, yeah. we can use we can use a bit of that star advantage and figure <laughs> how to yeah. work out strange rooms. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. So first thing I want to ask you guys was um, so how did uh, well so how would you describe Paul Vickers in the leg? Like what what is Paul Vickers in the leg? Like explain that to the folks at home. That's a very difficult one because obviously people ask all the time, like, what, what kind, what does the leg sound like, and and, and that kind of thing. And it's very, it's it's, it's very very difficult to to say that because it's. I mean, I don't, I don't feel like we sort of have a sort of genre or anything that we that that we play. But I mean, it's kind of like a holiday, like it feels like a holiday. A musical holiday. Well, it started as a musical holiday, but it's become. Yeah, it started very much as a collaboration, uh, and obviously still is a collaboration, but it's become more than a sort of collaboration. Um, and it was doing doing something different from what we normally do. When we do music with Paul, it's kind of like you know how, you know, like if you make music or whatever, you know, you have your own set of rules, you know, and limitations and things like that. You know, but then and when we work with Paul, that sort of goes out the window a little bit and it's a bit more sort of like, uh, you know, it'll be like, for example, like recently we did did a song and it was kind of like a little bit that sounded like Rush in it, <laughs> nice right? one. Uh, which we would never have put in a leg song. Yeah, I can see that working out, Shaq. I can see the more, the different nature of Paul's voice to yours could kind have of like... Yeah, uh... yeah. Plus, obviously, if you're playing Rush, that's quite technical on the guitar, I'd imagine. Well, so you'd have to like you might focus on that. It's actually just a tiny, tiny, tiny little little change. Uh, uh, Pete and John absolutely love Rush. They've got good albums. Like, uh, I, I, there's a couple of their albums I really love, but they've got like, a massive discography, and I've heard it's patchy in places. I've not visited yeah. the whole thing, but I'm not surprised Pete loves them. Though that sounds like it yeah. sounds like a total be up. What I know about Pete it sounds like a total be up his alley. So yeah, yeah. I suppose it's incredible musical dexterity involved in it, but I personally I don't listen to Rush. No, nor do I. But I think I think the bit that we used that we that we were doing that sounded a bit like Rush was more of their sort of like the sort of poppy end of what they do rather than the virtuoso type kind of side of things. They've got they've got some absolute banging stuff like Moving Pictures Twenty One Twelve are are fantastic albums. I w- I would say, but. Um, but oh, okay. I know, yeah, some folk, but some folk got really die hard out of them, and they had like a they have like this eighties period. I've heard that's meant to be a bit dot, meant to be a bit interesting, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which I kind of need to check out at some point. But um, but yeah, but, um, yeah, no, that's that, that's a fair answer to the question. Because I always kind of like I kind of think of you guys kind of like oh, it's Paul Vickers and the leg, and there's the leg. I always kind of think of it because it sounds there's stuff in common, but before the sounds are quite the sounds are quite different when it comes together. Yeah, they, I, I could it, I could think it's two different. I could think it was almost two effectively different bands. It just happened to have is, a lot of the same it's, people. It's and most, it, most, 
it most definitely is two different bands. Yeah, I mean, like it's we, not as simple as as two different lead singers. It's not as simple as that. Yeah, there's more to it. It's. I, of, I mean, when we when we started out, we didn't mean we wasn't we didn't know that we were going to carry on doing it as long as we have. You know, so we should have maybe given we should have maybe named it something different or something but we didn't know that it was gonna we'd carry on doing it so long well that ties in nicely to my next question which was going to be how did you guys come together because obviously i know paul was in dawn of the replicants before because yeah. it's funny because like a lot of folk would have known dawn of the replicants beforehand but i got yeah. into the replicants through listening to you guys right i, kind of went, I, I then went back and then because I, I, I found fangs i think it must have been in unknown pleasures or something so i own i i think it was in there or it was El- or it was Elvis Shakespeare. I found that one. So that's the only pop Donna Replicants on my own. But I, I found that one. But I I know that by from upon looking up, I was like, oh, Donna Replicants were were a fair thing. Like I know you guys had some fair. Uh, you put a few al- fair albums with that, and that was in Gala Shields, wasn't it? And then so I know you were yeah, doing that, and, I, and I, yeah, and I know that Dan and Pete and was not Alan was as well. Where you get you had Desk and you had Kaya with John before yeah, as well. That's right. Yeah, yeah, and John John was in Kaya as well and Desk. For quite a while yeah again bands that like you know i, I don't really i'd heard of again one once it, i'd heard of the leg i then was like oh like uh i'd heard i still actually need to listen to some cayenne desk actually i still haven't got around to doing that yet but well, I, I, it's, yeah, it's been on my I list mean, of checking out at some point c- certainly uh some of the kaya stuff's all right but i kind of view view that stuff as like we i started doing that stuff when i was like 17 um so to me the kind of real sort of stuff really just starts with the leg um yes yeah. <laughs> so how did you so how did you guys come together then like obviously you'll know each other from gigging with the bands well, we to, or heard that come apart alan, about. alan was friends with paul um and Ed Pibus was kind of involved. yeah as, it was from it was because we, we were on the same label on sl sl records and we 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 ended up doing stuff because we got asked to do uh, a thing for the Edinburgh Art College. It was like the like 100 years of the art college. Uh. They, were, they were making a video thing. So we got together just to do, it's like, like Ed suggested that we get together and ju- ju- just to do that. So we did that, and then we just, then we just, like, we just hit it off and just. Was that Ed? Was that Ed who ran SL Records? Or yeah. Right or right yeah. yeah. Well, I had this idea as well, where he thought that I should do some kind of solo album, and he thought like, you should. He said maybe you should do it with different people and um, and different collaborators for the whole album, and like, we kind of started that as an idea, and then the tracks with the leg went so well. That he just sort of said, "Why don't you just do an album with a leg?" You know, and um, and, and I was like, "Aye, right, let's do that." Then. Yeah, it's amazing that that's how it came together. Like, because because it's such such a great like pair. And you, you hear like the early leg stuff, like you know, what's it? A musical trip to the forest of Dean, eight songs by the leg. Like, you hear that, yeah. and then and then you hear the Donna Replicant stuff, and then you hear what you guys could have wanted to do together. It's like sonically, that makes a lot of sense for that to be paired well, together. I, I like, that's, they're I, different, yeah. but it makes a lot of sense. Oh, well, I'm glad that's that's nice that you say that because the thing is, is that me and Alan used to we used to go and before I knew Paul, would go and see Donna Replicants at like Henry's and stuff. And me and Alan were like, you know, with all due respect to Donna Replicants, we were like, I wish what we could do the music for Paul. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then it, and then it did did actually happen, you know. Yeah, there was a I went to see you, and you were sort of like, you know, we could we could do a well a better job of being your band is what was said, but like, um, which you know. Another thing here as well that's a funny story, right, Stuart? When I was growing up, like very near the forest of Dean, right, we used to, you know. Uh, went, went, it went into uh, into Woolworths, right? I don't know, it was, it was like about 15 or something, 14 or 15. Woolworths in Chepstow. And there was a magazine called Sunzoom Sparks, right? Uh, which, you know, which I, which I bought. And it was Paul's, it turns out it was Paul's uh, project from in Galashio. It wasn't his, it, it, <laughs> not just his, and he was putting out this thing. But when I was, so when I was like 14 or 15, right, I was read, I bought this magazine and I was reading reviews that Paul had written of things like Guided by Voices and stuff like that. Amazing. He was, talk, he was talking about chucking things, at, microphones out the window and all that. And I really connected with it. And then I obviously 
didn't think about it for years later. And then I knew that Paul had moved to Edinburgh and he was putting out records with SL and all that. But we know it just, just took us ages to sort of come together. But it's very weird that we ended that's up amazing. That's, together. That's amazing. Yeah. That's, that's such a cool story. Like, uh, that makes it like almost like a match made in whatever mystical atmosphere we live in. I was going to say yeah. heaven, but, you know, what? let's go with mystical, otherworldly atmosphere. Yeah, that, sounds, that sounds cooler. So. Yeah. yeah. I, I, think, that, I think for me as well with the replicants, um, We've done 10 years of it and we're all really good friends. We're still friends with everyone in the replicants. It's not like we we didn't ever officially split up. You know, I, you know, I love those guys. But it was just a, a case of like everyone was getting a bit frustrated, you know. People were going off doing their own thing, having families, all the rest of it, you know. Um, and I decided to move to Edinburgh and... Yeah, because I was sick of sitting in gala shields and twiddling my thumbs and, you know, it was getting a bit frustrating. And um, the problem with the replicants is we had a lot of success early on. Um, you know, we were signed to a major record label. Um, but then later on, we found it more difficult to keep that success going. Whereas we, we kind of had a career. It would have been better if we'd started on independent labels and then gone to a major label towards the end but we went from a major label to independent labels. So in the, in the press, from the point of view of the press, it seemed like we were getting smaller and smaller and smaller, if you see what I mean. They were always going, they, all the reviews were always like, these guys could have been someone, if you see what I mean. They were always <laughs> obsessed with the idea that we were... Such a wanky th- that's such a wanky thing to say, these guys could have been somebody. Like They are somebody, they're out there making music, they're doing something. Yeah, we're like... still doing stuff, yeah, exactly. This is good, that, yeah, but well, press will say stuff. don't really want to get involved with major labels and stuff like that because that's what it's all about, really. And for us, it's just about making making music, you know? I somehow doubt any major labels going to be interested in any of my musical output. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing seems like a million miles away now, you know? I think it was oh. partly the time as well, though. I mean, it was a time where more unusual bands were getting signed because it was like the... the post brit pop boom it was so, 20 years ago yeah yeah exactly <laughs> different but it was odd we were on a label with like the cars and oh and- I'll, i love i love the, <laughs> the, first, the first cars yeah. album i love it like cars had some good stuff after that but the, the first album is like flawless i love that's a great pop rock record i love that first album like a lot they were like the 80s before the 80s were a thing like oh it's so good man yeah it was the cars simply red david gray really odd and like but Steena Nordenstein she was the only one that was like a sort of a kindred spirit on that label but um but yeah it was very strange <laughs> <laughs> now that, that that's to bring it back so that's, that's interesting with the whole thing you talk about the magazine and stuff because um yeah because uh, so that would mean like so that when you were 15 or so you were saying Dan so that yeah. would be, so you'd have been like what well, a, a young young adult when you were writing that and stuff would uh Paul like you that I've been quite, you've been quite young when you were doing that. You'd still been quite young when you were doing the magazine. I think I was about twenty four when it started to kick off with the, with the replicants when it started. The magazine, oh the magazine, magazine. I was like early twenties, yeah. Yeah, I thought so because because yeah, because I knew there was like a few years between you guys, but that's, that's interesting. Just picturing like Dan, like at the end of his like your school, yeah. so you just pick up a magazine, you know, where you're starting like that. It's just quite interesting thinking about like that, and then how that like now you wouldn't think at all. You just see the pair of you know. To you, yeah. to you to be singing on records like back, you know, back and forth, or albums back and forth with each other and stuff. You just like yeah. when think back to someone writing a magazine and another person reading it, going, "Oh, this yeah. guy's cool." And, like, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think I think what is it like you, about five years age difference? I think so. Yeah, yeah I'm a bit older. I'm not much older than Alan. Alan's only a year younger than me, but um, I think he's the oldest member of the mic. Um, but yeah. We're all old. We're all old now, though. <laughs> Not young with our snappers <laughs> anymore. Um, yeah, okay, so, that's, so what you were saying around as well ties nicely to the other thing I wanted to ask as well before ending this section. It was about, like, so the first album was Tropical Favourites. Yeah. You were saying that um, you, you, the way one said, oh, go out, so do, you know, why don't you record with the leg and then the leg ones went well. When you were doing those recordings, was that what became Tropical Favourites or did you record some stuff before and then you thought no, well, hey we, this is great let's put Tropical Favourites we did it we did it before we did this thing for the art college uh, that went well and then Paul said oh, I've got, some, got, got, got a song that he'd written he had a song that he'd written with his brother in fact that was the first one that we did was, was 
wild geese. And so we did we did that, and then yeah, we just carried on basically. We just we did we just carried on, and we went went decided to do do the do tropical favorites, which was I have really good memories of that because. At the time, me and Alan were living in this farmhouse uh, out at Liberton. We could make as much noise as we wanted. We used to have gigs on a Sunday night there, you know, uh, like house gigs. It was it was amazing. Um, so that was we we were we were in a really good position to be. Able, and Pete had also just started to get into setting up his own studio and and that that kind of stuff. Um, so. Yeah, it was we, a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun, yeah. And it was like we recorded one song outside. It was like Pete's obviously amazing at recording and cello. Definitely, and, he's done such a good job. He's done such a good job with all the all the like and Paul Lay and the white records. Yeah, he, he has, he's, 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 he has he's done such a good job with all those. Yeah, he, he has done so. So all those things all coincided at once, and we just had a brilliant time making that record. It was amazing. It was. I just remember it being really sunny. Uh, at one point we were like let's record outside which we've never actually done before or since really uh although i have noticed if you record outside you get an amazing sound uh i think because it's sort of like you know the acoustics are completely different and stuff yeah and alan was playing a barbecue wasn't he or like the barbecue <laughs> yeah yeah it was it was it was so it was one it was one of my best memories of sort of making something was that that record I I see that came out and um, I've got I've got my I've got notes here because uh, when I was doing my uh, just making sure I knew the dates for when the albums were yeah. coming out and stuff. So I've got that came out in February two thousand and eight. Um, so was that recorded just the year before, or did you record that quite quickly and stick it out? It would have been done quite quickly and put out, but I mean, at that time, it was there wasn't really a case of you, you probably step out so months. quickly. Yeah, I mean, a few months. It wasn't like we could we could put it up on the. Bandcamp or anything like that, or you know, like it took it took much longer then because you had to wait for CDs to come back and you know all that kind of thing. Um, but it, I, I don't know. We, we, it was pretty quick though the process. It would have been recorded and mastered and sent 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 out fa fairly quickly, probably quicker than we do now. In fact, and that was um, that would have been recorded. That was that recorded at the farmhouse at Liberton that you and Alan were living at. It then, was rather, yeah. than, rather, rather than a pumpkin field. Where, so yeah, we should probably give a shout to Pumpkinfield actually while we're on here because like oh, he's got up recording studio yeah. Pumpkinfield. So if anyone's when this is over looking to record some cool stuff, should definitely hit Pete up. I mean, I'm I'm hoping to go and record with him at some point. I, I would oh, love to go out to record with Pete. So it's like, amazing, and I mean, he's he's got he's got an amazing setup now, and he's his ears are just just phenomenal. He's just really, really good at what he does. Um, but so he started off re recording, you know, just in locations like the farmhouse and stuff like that. And then I don't know when it was like probably like about about 2010 or something. He moved to where he lives now in, uh, and so it's Perth, Perth Shire Way, isn't it? Pumpkin Fields. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very near Perth. Um, sorry, sorry, I, I we we'll cut Paul off there. I think you're trying to say something. Sorry, no, I'm sorry, just, the first record he recorded was the. I mean, his, his actual studio was the Pineapple Chunks, um, which James, James's band, and then, yeah. and then the second album we recorded, I think was, was it? Um, we're jumping a bit. Uh, we were. I think we tra tracked the Green Grosser. Actually, I think it was probably the second album we did, but Please. like. But we're missing out Itchy Grumble, which we yeah, we'll, 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 we'll,
so it's, it's, it's quite worth giving that a shout as well like i'll be um i'm, I'm going to talk to james on this as well on the on, on another episode of this like um mm. well when once once he knows what's happening with that i'm going to get him on and discuss yeah. the, the, the history of the chunks that's a, that's a whole different uh thing that like you know this is this is, this is your time this is not this is a... yeah well you know one, one of my one of the fa- favorite uh gigs i've ever done was when we we did and this was about 10 years ago uh the leg and the pineapple chunks and we played at the bongo club and uh we played played upstairs uh, part of this club night and we said, they said, you know, do whatever you want. So we had both bands like sort of facing each other. We were playing, the leg was play, playing a leg song. The chunks were playing a chunk song. And then and at the same time, it was, it was, it was great. Like, and then, and uh, then we went into this long improvised noise thing and then ended with a cover of Moonlight Shadow. And it's just one of our best memories. The, the drummer from the chunks at the time, Owen, was like, climbing all, all over the kit and it was it was, it was really, he, it's a really he, good memory he's that sounds amazing he's he's a mad drummer i've seen him play in a more recent band that he did like, like a year or so ago i yeah. can't remember their name uh they played like a city glass gig i can't remember their depot i can't remember their name i saw him play and then nora told me that like that was uh that he was um the james's old drummer and i was like oh no way like because he, he was great yeah. like he was a really cool he was just like like crazy like yeah, just a great, yeah, great great great, great drummer yeah. um but yeah, well, what I'll do is I'll uh, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll cut the first section off off here. Uh, yeah. So uh, well, that'll be a good spot to go and play some songs. Oh, bumblebee, oh, bumblebee, you'll never be a part of me. Your lungs ain't fit for the underwater bed. Oh, bumblebee, oh, bumblebee, you'll never be a part of me. Your lungs ain't fit. The underwater bed Now you're flying But you want it to float You sting like a bee But you act like a goat Now you're flying But you want it to float You got a tennis spring All in the spokes All in the spokes Like an octopus A snake sails Back and through the window I'm a bird
give me my love Smooth singing sunshine Smooth singing sunshine Wrap your blanket round me Wrap your blanket
So anyone listening just now will have heard Oba Moby with Donna the Replicants, uh, do a little twirl by the leg, um, Octopus's Garden by the Beatles, uh, Blue Crystal Fire by Robbie Basho, and um, Where the Wand is Wild by Paul Vickers and the leg. Um, so next part, uh, I guess the next thing to ask you about I mean, would be, I think I think I meant to ask you the first bit would be, so when when was the first was it, so the, was the first gig you guys get together? What well, that was the art show, the art school, and that was the first. Yeah, it would have been. Yeah, we only one. had we only had we only had like uh, one song at that at that time when we did that. And then at the time, I just started getting into playing the banjo, and I was just playing something on the banjo, and Paul said, "Was like, oh, I've got an I, I, I could do something over that kind of thing, which was Train Train Cherry." Yeah, 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 uh, uh, and that and that sort of sparked, sparked it off, I think, and then we just we just carried on after that. Cool. Uh, so then the next album was Itchy Grumble. Uh, that yeah. was two thousand and also February two thousand and ten, according to what I could find online. I don't know how accurate the band camps the band camp is with the dates that they came out and stuff. Yeah. But that's um, what it said. It's fairly accurate because Pete does it, so it's probably quite accurate. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't remember exact, even exact years that we did, did things up for for a lot of them. But Itchy Grumble was a good one because we did Tropical Favorites, and then quite quickly, I remember Paul phoning me up and saying, "I've got an idea for this sort of musical type thing." And I was like, "Right, okay." I can't remember what the first gig that we did together was, but I can remember the first gig that we did for Itchy Grumble. Because, oh, amazing! Do tell because the whole thing just had like this vague concept. And we were like, we'll just improvise the whole thing. So we, so we did this gig at Cabo Voltaire, and we just basically improvised pretty much all the way through. <laughs> yeah, it was a nightmare. <laughs> I remember, like, I remember the sound check after the sound. We're check. like, we won't write this record. We won't write it. We'll just, we'll just, we'll just improvise it each time we do it, which is, and it just, yeah, sorry, it evolved. But I remember, yeah. like, that, that was the most depressed I've ever been after the sound check. <laughs> Because I remember us just sort of thinking, we were all just thinking, oh my God, that sounds absolutely awful. Yeah, it was scary. It was like, <laughs> it was like why, why did we, why did we, that's another ridiculous idea. But yeah, but actually the gig was actually surprisingly good. Um, like, it's one of those things where when you put in that, yeah, you need the like terror of an audience to actually really yeah and it did it did help shape it because the whole thing was did have that kind of feel to it and it was the kind of thing but uh, eventually over a a couple more gigs and then a a few sort of uh sessions of recording and stuff uh it did actually become a little bit more formed and we went to tyree as well so well yeah yeah we went to tyree to record it which was absolutely amazing where's where's tyree well tyree is and I, that's a bit before my. That's a bit before my. That's a bit before my. I mean, it's a, it's a recording studio. But I'm not. I've heard of it or anything. Or is it a place? It's not a recording studio. It's an island. Oh, it's it's an island, island, right? Uh, right. And it's, it's a very flat island. There's uh, really not very much there. But Alan, the people that Alan were work, was working for had a uh, a cottage there, and they let us. They kindly let us use it. So. And actually, now and there's somebody else who has a cottage there as well. Um, I, so we went, we went up there. It was amazing. It's like, I mean, I don't, I'm not entirely sure exactly where it is. It's quite far out. It took about three hours on the ferry to get there. And Pete had to drive over a golf course to get to the cottage. Yeah, you have to drive over fields to get to the I cottage. We it was amazing. It that. was amazing. Like, uh, yeah. So is it like, is it off the coast of like the UK somewhere then? Or is yeah, it, uh, it's, it's a Scottish island. Uh, I can't remember the exact. It's in the Hebrides, is it not? The... Is that? Yeah, yeah. You, you go from. Uh, yeah. That's nah, so quite no, quite north then. So. Yeah, but there's only there's yeah. only about like seven houses there or something like that. So, sounds like the perfect place to write an album, to be honest. Yeah, it was great. We had a brilliant time doing that. It was amazing. So, so did uh, you just go there and then work on yeah, it basically, and, and then people kind of people 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 recorded it again? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We went there for, for for a week and did a similar thing to what we did with well with Tropical Favorites. We that was done over sort of like time a bit of time, not as much. It wasn't like we spent a week doing it. It was longer than that. But with Itchy Grumble, we just had to just went for the week, and and we did it, and it was amazing. It had its ups and downs. Uh, but it was a, it was an amazing week. Uh, like I'll never forget it. The people on the island were very suspicious of music, or people who created. They, they were. They, 
Yeah. Well, you've like you've like you've well, like doubled the, you've doubled you've doubled their population by going there though. But the <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. at this because at this point there's just the four of you. So yeah, to make it clear, I mean, like obviously, yeah, I know and you guys know because you, you were doing it stuff. But if anyone listening doesn't know, um, that yeah, the like were there was there was yeah there was yeah it was just you it was you Dan sorry it was you Alan and. Uh, okay. And Pete and with Paul at the time, and then obviously expanded later. But we just we'll just yeah. made that clear just now, just in case anyone. I mean, I think most folk who will probably check this out will will probably know. But yeah. it's more just making it clear that at this point, the word you're not the six headed beast yet. Yeah, yeah. The biggest <laughs> fear was that people would come. The guy who'd been there before as a band was the guy at Razor Light. You know, oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> the guy oh, who yes, I, re- I remember them. Oh dear. God, to the Good song. God. Oh, these people in America. The guy who wrote that song, and like, um, yeah, he was recovering from his relationship with Kirsten Dunst, I think. And oh, it, that's right, they were. Yeah, the relationship with her. He was like, so he was apparently he stayed there for ages, and we were the next <laughs> residents in there. He kept it well, like, but there was the locals would come and they would knock on the door, which was terrifying when you were really stoned. So we <laughs> let her. Alan deal with them and they were Yeah, and this guy came down and knocked knocked on the door, this old guy. And we were in the middle of recording and uh came and sat down. He, yeah, he was just he was just, you know, just trying to figure out what we were all about and all that. I remember just diving into this like little upstairs loft bit to sleep whilst he was doing that. Uh he was saying things like, like, Oh, you're playing music, do you? Yeah. And he said, Oh, there was a guy who owned a jukebox. But we don't see him anymore. And it was a bit like, what happened to him? Did you kill him? You know, so it's very odd. I kind of thought there'd be loads of people there, like sort of like, well, I thought there'd be people there, but there wasn't really many people there. And there was a supermarket and then there was another place. Yeah, it was that only opens, on, Scott made that only opens on Tuesday or something like that. <laughs> I suppose it's it very viable. Only <laughs> open on Tuesdays. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't yeah. very viable. This is like a very viable business. No, but I, but I mean, I guess that they must have to, they obviously have to have that shop there. I mean, maybe they get some kind of like sort of government uh, subsidy or something. But I mean, there's, I mean, no, I there, know, there I, was another shop though. There was a shed. And like we, we went to the shed one time to try and buy things there. And like, we had some electrical problems. With, like, with a guy who had a rope tied around his trousers yeah we had an electrical problem and they were like we were like where can we get this particular bit of cable and we like got directed off to this sort of shed type place i remember you talking about letters because they they, they, uh, alan and pete decided that me and dan should go and speak to the guy because they just thought it'd be humorous i think i remember you were obsessed with the idea of buying food that was grown off the land and you was thought, I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you thought, <laughs> you know, that would that, be a place to get food that was grown off the land. And then we went up to the guy and you said, oh, do you grow lettuce? And the guy was like, no. Basically, all they did is they went to the mainland, bought up loads of stuff and then just put it in this shed. So it was a shed full of like fridges, um, frozen food, bikes you know just anything they just yeah, put it in the shed just just, just casually just casually bikes with food <laughs> 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 that yeah, sounds yeah. amazing that, that, that that's that, 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 that sounds like a tw- that sounds like a twonky show waiting to happen that bikes with yeah, food yeah it was like father ted it was like father yeah. ted. oh i love father ted father ted's an amazing show like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny it's funny you telling that story about the jukebox there and also about the lettuce thing because it's it sounds like were these influences for green grocer by any chance look we could talk about that more later but, but it sounds like i could see almost that being a part of yeah, that or something because yeah. you, you mentioned the whole yeah they've not been there for many years thing and i, I know there's a song I mean, we're getting we're, we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves but there's a song on green grocer which i know you talk about some cable car not being and some, some path oh, of showing not been there for years yeah, yeah. That's probably so, the best track on that album. Well, so I, w- I, w- I wondered if I wondered if that maybe conspired that or anything, or that's just coincidence. Uh, I'd say there's definitely a kind of like sort of a thing that we were interested in at that time. You and... were very interested in letters. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's a thing to be interested that, in. I know. Another, I've heard another story about myself about lettuce. Yeah, lettuce. Uh, <laughs> <and> then... <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I just have some subconscious thing that comes out when I'm really wrecked about lettuce. I well, you know. always <laughs> on, on CVs when you try and get jobs, you always put. You, know, oh, like, you can't say that. You, know. <laughs> no. 
he used to work at the Laughing Cabbage or whatever it was. It's funny you mentioned the lettuce thing, but I think some of folk do just get obsessed with certain things when they've had something to drink or they're or they're on something. Because my stepbrother, like, he seems to have a thing with potatoes. I don't know, like, right. but that is like I know this before. My my sister told me about it. I was when I was when I was um. It was yeah. It was like I remember he he he, uh, he phoned us once and he was just he was he was just, and he was just like he'd been drinking. He was just talking about like potatoes and I was like, what? Why yeah, are you talking about potatoes? Well, and then like and, and then my sister then was like, oh, he does that when he's drunk. And I'm like, does he? I've not seen that before. Yeah, right. It, it's a, no, but it's but it's an interesting thing that because we were talking about this at Christmas about how you know everybody has like a sort of mundane thing. So we we had Christmas with Kira and uh, and Andy, right? And uh, we were talking about that because Kira just loves bins. She really? loves bins. She loves bins. Like every time we go to the bargain store, or or maybe it'd be like a Saturday morning. It'd be, it'd be like, "What do you want to do today?" And it's like, "I want to go and buy a, a new bin." And it's like, <laughs> it's like we're, we're, right, okay. But she she loves them. She loves them. That's fine. It's like everybody's got some kind of like mundane thing that they that they find fascinating or that they just really like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and maybe lettuce is just mine. Yeah, no, you have a thing about lettuce. There was another thing about lettuce, but I can't remember what it was. But there was another incident where you got excited about lettuce. But I yeah. think I think the greengrocer thing partly came from where I used to live in Stockbridge with Mary. When I looked out the window, there was a shop directly opposite that was just said the greengrocer, and it was always like lit up at all times of the day or night, and. It just stuck with me, you know, it had that open all hours kind of feel to it and it made it seem like the greengrocer was quite a strange thing, if you see what I mean. Obviously it isn't a strange thing, but No, but I, I can tell I can totally see where your mind would go with that and stuff. So Yeah. Um but we before we get onto that thought, um I just come over. Th- I want to say one come over things with Itchy Grumbles before we move on with that one. Uh with Itchy Grumble, that's interesting because for me, like I think like they're all obviously they're all great records, all great albums and stuff. But I think like in terms of the, before the expansion into the six piece and stuff, I think I like Itchy Grumble the best out of those out of those three. But I think I might be because that was the first Paul and the Leg album I heard. Like I remember buying that from Elvis Shakespeare. So I remember sticking that on in the house and being like, "Oh, this is like quite cool." Because that was the first Paul and the Leg album yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd heard, and I remember being like, "This is cool." But it's well, quite interesting when it wasn't all your just albums together because like that one is quite dark and quite menacing, and like whereas like yeah. the one before Trouble of Favorites is much more of a almost a can I say the word romp? It's almost a kind of a romp, kind of like folky, kind of yeah, well, that's good, uh, yeah, or that's joyous good. kind of thing. Whereas it like Itchy well. Grumble is so dark, like it's a really yeah, dark, I see, I it see really it dark. Like I see it like that. Uh, Itchy Grumble is the kind of thing when you put it on, you listen to it all the way through. If you see what I mean, like it's oh, it, it feels more like that. Like it's a, it works as a piece. If you see what I mean, mm. which was kind of the idea of it, really, to like construct it as a. As an actual, mm, I mean, I would say at this point that Itchy Grumble is my favorite one musically. It's quite, it's quite cool. Like it's um, there's some minimal, there's some kind of like weird structurally things going on. You're getting some quite minimal things on it, but like yeah. structurally, there's quite a lot of interesting things going on with it. I'd say like yeah. there's more playing going on on Tropical Favorites in terms of like, yeah, I guess technical aspects and stuff. Whereas I guess I would say on your Itchy Grumble one, there's there's, there's more about there's a lot of cool sounds going on and like weird textures and yeah, I would say I would it's say be haunting and just like almost evil in places but like in yeah. the right measures it's got this sort of well that's, that's the thing i think i i think i think for me like uh like like you say like tropical favorites was like uh it was just like sort of like chuck everything in that we were enjoying and it was a sort of romp type kind of thing whereas itchy grumble as much as it was improvised and sort of like worked out like that it had a more i did to have a darker kind of sort of more it's, despite being improvised, it had a more sort of like streamlined, definite kind of sound to it. And it was also like a concept album as, as well. Like I think I've never I've never done one before or since. There, there was there was plans to turn it into like a stage show, and I wrote a script for it, and then it ended up not happening for various reasons. And then I ended up writing a book which is basically like the storyline of Itchy Grumble because I ended up developing it enough to the point where I had a proper storyline and all the rest of it, and, you know, um, and characters, which differed slightly from the album, but it's progressed, the story. So, yeah, that became a... I mean, maybe at some point, eventually, we will get to do the stage show of it, but but that well, hasn't... 
Yeah. Well, we'll consider a ticket for that sold already. I'll I'll totally buy a ticket for that if that ever happens. So. Well, we did actually do a gig in Glasgow where we built a a lighthouse that span round. We had this meeting and oh, it was cool. like, and we were like, no, you can't do that. I said, no, we no, we can't. We had we built this light lighthouse and it was made out of felt. It wasn't made out of felt. It was made out of this big pole thing. It was covered in felt, the same as like the masks that we like use and, and things. And so we we got quite close to actually progressing with it as an actual sort of like sort of production but then various things happened and it didn't it didn't it didn't quite work out but um yeah well there was a there was a, a director and a producer and oh, neil, wow. neil cooper was quite involved and then they all went through to glasgow and had some kind of meeting where they were supposed to be fin- filling in a funding application um but for whatever reason they just had a complete meltdown I remember getting all these. They wanted to cut Neil out of the. Neil, Neil Cooper helped us loads with getting up with, with all of that. And then, as I understand it, they basically, these people wanted to cut Neil out out of the whole process. And we were like, nah. And then it fell, and then it completely fell apart after uh, uh, after that. Like, it's a shame to hear about that. Maybe you guys did the right thing there, I think, because Neil's a lovely dude. Like, he's always been yeah, super exactly, supportive of yeah. uh, gigs when I've met him. And, you know, he, he gives you guys always a support as well. Like, yeah, he's written I mean, some he, good he articles on you like, guys and stuff. You know, he's, he he's a cool dude. We, I like Neil a lot. Yeah. He set up that gig that we did in Glasgow and was helping us so much with it. And then these other people that came in and got involved wanted us to just completely cut him out. Yeah. yeah, all, yeah got, but, all got a bit weird. And then it just sort of, yeah, fell apart. Well, for for anyone who might be listening to this when it comes out and stuff as well, just to sort of make that clear, Neil's Neil Cooper. He writes for like the Herald and stuff, doesn't he? He's written for other things too, hasn't he? But he writes for like the Herald, Scotland these yeah. days. If you see Neil Cooper on like reviews and stuff online or articles about kind of interesting bands and stuff like that, and he writes about plays and stuff, doesn't he? As well, he does he other. Does, yeah, other you know, and he encourages to do that because yeah. originally it was just oh. a concept. He album. was a big part of that. He was a big part of the Itchy Grumble yeah. kind of thing. So we did a couple of gigs at the the video rooms and. And, and and Neil, I remember him sort of saying, "You need to develop this into like a theatre show, you know." And obviously, he's a theatre man, really. So, like, you know, he was encouraging us to develop it in that way. Yeah, and it, it, I was glad that he did encourage us to do that. Looking back on it, we were a bit—I was a bit naive about it all, and we all were really. There's a different world that. I kind of know music. more about that now than I did then because I ended up doing like a, a, a musical thing, Jennifer's Robot, um, later at the Fringe and learnt a lot from that experience as well. But like it, it got to a level where we needed like a Terry Gilliam style budget, you know. And oh, like, yeah, the guy, the Moy Python things like in like the. Yeah, yeah, the, with so. like blue screen. And I had bad dreams where I was getting drowned in like a, a sort of a stage set, you know, and. It got to a point where we could see it happening, but it would involve a lot of money, I presume, I mean, to make it happen because it became quite a big idea. And then I thought, the only way this idea is going to be like fully realised on that level is if I write it as a book. Because then there's no restraints of like of, of imagination, and you can just go the whole way with it. Well, we'll get to the book later on because I know you recorded that, and that came out during like the lockdown kind of period. Well, the sort of summer oh, last yeah. year and stuff. So, I uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later on. But the one other thing I wanted to ask about Itchy Grumble before we went to Greengrocer would be: so you were saying that you did that first gig was like an improvised thing and stuff. So was like were all the words and stuff and all the was so was all that kind of together like already, and then the music was improvised, or was the whole, or was some of the words I, I improvised think it was with music, the music too? The music so. that was improvised, wasn't it? I mean, basically, you had the whole concept, and a there lot was, of the yeah, the story was sketched out. I mean, it wasn't fully realised, but the story was kind of sketched out, and then, um, and then, yeah, I mean, I think that's well, that's the thing with Itchy Grumble is like sort of, um, it's one of those projects that I don't think it'll ever be finished. You'll keep going though, but I'm waiting for your uh, six part Netflix series. Like, so. <laughs> it's finished. <laughs> no, I don't think it is finished. I don't think we could go back to that at any point. Have you seen um? There's an there's an episode of South Park where they're like there's a guy working for Netflix and the kids phone him up and he just says hello, welcome to Netflix. You're greenlit. <laughs> so like that's all you gotta do quickly just phone up Netflix and ask them to do an Itchy Grumble TV Maybe series. Maybe we should so, do that. Yeah, yeah. Make I it don't think it's <laughs> to me, it's unfinished business. And, and like, I um, mean, it was always basically. It was meant to be. Really, I think the thing is, is it was meant to be 
a big production rather than an album or a book or anything like that. And we got very, very close to doing it, but you know, as often happens with, with these kind of things, it didn't quite happen. It's one of those things where you look back and it went, the way I look back on it now is like when I am dead, you know, that that's it. That was it. The Itchy Grumble was it, if you know what I mean. It was like that, that to me, it feels like the big flawed thing, the, the big lumbering beast that if you wanted to analyse and look over everything, you would be picking on that first, if you know what I mean. That's the thing. Because there's, there was a lot of meat on it. And yeah, that, and like you know, they always make a fuss of trap mash replica, and that's the closest we've come to doing something of that ilk. If you see what I mean, something that stands alone from time itself, that's kind of like a timeless piece of work, that is like, you know, like Alistair Gray, Lanark. It's like a sort of it's just a thing, a big lumbering thing, and it still feels like that in my head. It still feels like that. It feels like a a big thing. Um, Whereas other things feel like, well, that's an album, that's this, that's that. But Itchy Grumble isn't just an album, it's like a world. Yeah. It's like it's a, a whole thing, you know, it's like, it's it's our Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Uh... It's, it's it's cool to hear that it's it's good as well it's good as well that you guys have all that to say about it because I mean it's it's sometimes we kind of you think oh what's your favorite like album by somebody and stuff as well it's sometimes interesting talking about it like you know because I know we've had this conversation as well about like the leg records on their own and yeah. stuff that about what what what, what uh one of them I like the most of as well it, it's just it's quite interesting to sort of you can think oh sometimes like you like the, this one album that somebody you know and then the artists might be like oh that's um you know oh that one you know that's that's not where we were at you know this this one this one's our favorite and stuff so it's actually nice to talk about that and kind of i guess yeah. i'm saying oh this is probably my favorite of these three and then you guys are like oh that's our favorite too it's it's nice yeah. when this happens and you can yeah, like, you yeah. know in an awkward situation where i'm kind of like well i think you were better here and you guys are like well no actually like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah yeah no yeah. i mean whenever i listen to it you go and, well, i listen to it all the way through and it's like i treat it as a special event you know i don't sort of um whereas with other albums i listen to them more casually and more frequently do you? But when but when I listen to Itchy Grumble, I, I would set aside. The, I'd be I have to be in the right frame of mind to listen to it. Cause it's it's like yeah. what thir- it's like what thirty five forty minutes, isn't it? Or yeah, something? yeah, it's only half an hour, but it's. I find it quite. Oh intense. yeah, shorter, shorter, isn't it? Because I, I listen. I think because before I before this, I, I listened to them all like again all the way through all the like all, all these ones through again before and you guys. Just, so I just I made sure I had to you know, I'd play it to like. I had heard them all before, but it's just good to kind of like have them all particularly fresh and stuff. And I remember, like, when you listen to that one, you're like, "Oh, like this is quite short," but like, I guess it like it it does the job in that length of time. Yeah. Some you don't eat, you know, some you don't eat waffle. I guess it's just there's, there's not much there's no waffle on that. It just like does it. And yeah. There's that song which itchy grumble on it that I really like. That's my favorite song on the album. And like, it's just well, when you get to play that, and you don't you don't know when that's going to you don't know when that's going to end. Like, yeah. and that's what I like about it. You're like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. With all those those kind of stabby bits at the end, and mop that stuff. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, I remember, I remember the one time I I put you guys on at the depot, like as Paul Vickers in the leg. Like I, I you guys played that at the end, and it was and it was ace. Like yeah, that was definitely an enjoyable a song to play. So hearing it with like with like the six with like this the expanded lineup, it was oh, it was really cool. Yeah, oh, good. Yeah, definitely pleased with that. Definitely. Well, not well, not to pry you away from it, you grumble because it sounds like you guys have a lot to say about that. Yeah, but we do we do we do we do have to discuss the child that is the greengrocer. Yeah, as well. So you discuss that then. That was um 2004. Well, it depends on why because I was looking up trying to work out when that one came out. It said like 2014 in some places and 2015 in other places. No one really knows when that came out. I mean, it kept coming out like Neil Cooper joke that like he says. I said, oh, we're doing an amber lodge for Green Well, that's just because you got ahead of yourself. And he said, have I not already been to that? Because I think we we kind of, um, <laughs> we felt like we released it about three times. But, like, it became fragmented with that because what happened is is they went off and did the leg and they started doing the stuff with Song by Toad. And that became, like, you know, like quite a serious thing. And like between them doing all of that and me starting to do Twonky more seriously, we were working on the green grocer. So like the whole process of it was much more fragmented than usual. And in that respect, it was a bit of a bitty kind of project. 
it felt like more of a side project at that point than it had been previously. Whereas when we were when we were doing Tropical Favourites, when we were doing Itchy Grumble, we were together quite intensively for the process of writing and, and recording it. Whereas with the Green Grocer, it was more fragmented. It was over a long period of time, and it was something that we kept chipping away at. And it's, it's in that respect, I think it's quite flawed. It sort of has some individual tracks, which are some of the best things we've done. But overall, it's more flawed, I think, because I'm really pleased with Polynesian Snuff. And um, yeah, we still play that. Yeah, that, that, that's a really cool one. I really like the, the title track on it as well. Oh yeah, that's I good. Her. Yeah, I really yeah. like that one as well. And then what was another one on that I remember standing at the time because I was trying because I was trying to pick what song off of that I thought summed the album up best. And I thought yeah. Green Grocer was the one to sum it up, but the Polynesian one is yeah. pretty good. But I didn't think it was a good portrayal of yeah. the whole thing. And then there's that one Chaos Magic I thought was really cool as well. Wow. The whole the whole thing is great, but those are probably the three that stood out the most in my head. What I remember about that is that me and Paul had like maybe like literally just like one evening writing those songs. And then, more than that, but yeah. And then, and and um, in a way, it sort of maybe came too quickly. We, did, we tried to do that too quickly off the back of Itchy Grumble. There's some songs on that I think are great. Like um, there's one called My Trifle, which I really like. Which is when Pete got married, uh, Paul took this massive trifle that he'd made, right? And it, <laughs> I don't know. It had like about fucking six, yeah, six packets of. Harris, a really nice in this, this this thing, and he carried around carried around at Pete's wedding all day with him, and uh, that's commitment. Said, we'll try and find somewhere to put this, and then the song was originally going to be called "My Miasma," wasn't it? Ah, oh, miasmas, yeah. And, uh, you no, know, you need to change that to "My Trifle." So that one. What's a fun. what's a miasma actually? I'm... Why <laughs> my asthma's like a bad smell? Like, <laughs> like that, nah. so you can't write the song about a bad smell. So forget about trifle instead. Forget about trifle, which kind of was like a bad smell at the wedding because it, uh, I remember at the end the thing that the, the trifle was put in the bin. But at the end, well, we, we don't know it was put in the bin. It was I left on the shelf in a restaurant. Pete said, go and see if you can get a label put in that. <laughs> so that's what for the guy, and the guy who was running the, the wedding. And he basically said, I think your your trifle will upset the orchestra of the meal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for you guys to release an album where there's a line of and the trifle was left there for many years. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was my best attempt at, uh, at your accent, Paul. I, I really can't do it. Like, uh, I'm I'm too I'm too Scottish to like to do it properly. <laughs> yeah, well, Pete's still embarrassed about it when I push him out because I think what happened is he went the next day and I just put it in the bin. But, <laughs> but um. <laughs> But yeah, no, that's 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 gone. So there is there's a genuine pain in, in that, but I mean I think um it was a wee bit of a concept album, but not quite. It was kind of it was kind of a mix between Tropical Favourites and Itchy Grumble in some respects. Out of your four albums, that was the one I was the least familiar with. Like I, yeah. I remember I remember I bought it on vinyl from from you, Paul. I can't remember what gig it was at. I think it might be the one I put you on. I remember I bought that then. Um, but it's the one I've definitely heard the least. Um, so it's quite fun listening to it again and hearing those ones I mentioned that were quite cool. Um, yeah. But I, I, I thought, like, because when, when I took notes then just for to make to discussion stuff, one of the things I remember thinking at the time was that there's, there's it's in a more baroque and classical in places than the other right. than the than the other two. Just in places like the sort of listening to more of that sort of influence yeah. going on in it. Uh, yeah. I get what you mean with it being in between, but that's kind of I, I take off. It's definitely more. There's something yeah, there's more. There's like, more beat on it actually in some respects. So, yeah. The Baroque's maybe a good word for it, actually. I was going to say classical, but Baroque's maybe the better word for yeah, some well, of it. Yeah, well, Bojo said it was it. like, um, they said it was like beef at, um, at a medieval cart or something. Um, That's pretty spot on, I would say. I don't know. Who who said that about it? Mojo, I think it was. But like, um, I know what they mean, but yeah. Yeah, I suppose it does have that to it. Um, and obviously there's a the whole King Crea sort of thing. And we went out there and did like a few fence collective gigs, um, and he kind of put it out on his little label when he was trying to do something there or whatever. Fence collective, fence, you say? Yes, yeah, <laughs> I heard of them. So <laughs> yeah, well, there was a, there was a point where we sort of got 
drafted in on, on the fencing. And they were good. Those gigs in Anstro were, were really nice. Anstro there's beautiful. I went there like in the in the summer. Actually, it's a lovely place. It is amazing. Yeah, you don't know what it's like for gigging, but it's nice, quiet, and chill. It's like it's a good good place for a little getaway, like uh, with someone you you love and stuff. I think. So, yeah, so it's, yeah, uh, nice. yeah. The gigs yeah. we did there was quite amazing. How many people have actually turned up to them? Yeah, there's a big support for what the, what they do. Because like, yeah, but... years ago we did a gig for fence and it was a disaster. Um, Oh my god! It was in like Preston Pans or something, and um, oh god, yeah, no, I can't remember what happened there. But it was. Did you not run out into the road and then they got run out? Possibly. We bus? we did used to take a lot of drugs back at that time. <laughs> yeah, but you, you're in a bad mood, and then and then there was a point after the gig where you ran into the street. I remember you were running up to me during the gig and saying, "This isn't going very well, is it?" There was what I remember. Yeah, that was like you could try plugging in your guitar. That was, one, that was one of those terrible, 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 really drunken gigs. Um, uh, I remember there was a there was a piano on the stage. I remember that, and uh, mm. just thinking. Okay, well, the highlight of the gig piano. was the performance of Knackered Old Twits. Yeah. It was one of the worst gigs ever. <laughs> Is it, was it akin to that to the first time we met Dan when you played with Tardigrades and you were and you, oh <laughs> yeah yeah you had a bit of a bad you had a bit of an interesting time then it was a bit like that yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> I've seen you play when you when you're a bit gone so I've got an idea yeah, of what that might yeah. have been like so. it can happen I mean try to avoid that but you know I like I like it when uh, I, I hate it when people are just like really professional and you know. You're going to get through the show and everything's all going to be fine. It's like, um, it's better when there's a bit of unpredictability going on. Definitely. Um, although, a lot of that day was about making curry, though. I remember spending hours chopping vegetables with Alan. It was like a big emphasis on making a lot of food, I remember. And then it seemed like the gig was almost an afterthought. A lot of it was food. Yeah, breakfast. I mean, when you go out, when you go and do, when you, when, if you do gigs in like other sort of like outside of Edinburgh or other places or whatever, you know, there can be a lot of, it's a long time leading up to it and a, a lot a lot can go wrong. <laughs> yeah, a lot went wrong that time, but they made up for it. You I, mean, that's... I remember Kenny dropped his head in on that one and he looked and he was like, this is a bad scene and left quite quick. But like, but you know, <laughs> later on, you know, we, we made up for it by gigs in Anstruther, I think. Um, Since cool, I hope more gigs happen in Anstruther when we can get out of this because that'd be ace to play in, like, or just to yeah, see some. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, I, I would go Anstruther exclusively for a gig. Like, that sounds like an amazing idea. Yeah, yeah. And I would do, I would do, I would do a gig on like the beach or something in Anstruther. That'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, that. it's like the Scottish Riviera, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really is a Scottish Riviera. That's what it is. But, um, yeah. So, so with Greengrocer, where did you guys record that one? Actually, just uh, we recorded that at Pumpkinfield. That was the uh, oh, yes, right. Sorry, Paul said it was the second album Pete recorded. Yeah, so yeah, well, I mean, uh, yeah. So we recorded that there, and at that point, um, it was more like just using rooms in the house and stuff like that as a studio. Whereas now he has it like the the garage and what used to be the carport thing as a control room and stuff like that so it was the kind of last one we did not before he had it as a like proper studio kind of thing cool right if, well sorry but you were something paul well no and then you then you move on to jump i suppose yeah well what i'll do now is i'll um we'll, we'll break the second part here before we discuss jump in the audiobook and um and becoming a bigger band It 
it should grumble, it should grumble down in the pit. It should grumble, it should grumble down in the pit. It should grumble, it should grumble down in the pit. It should grumble, it should grumble down in the pit.
Those listening will have played Itchy Grumble by Paul Bickers in the Leg, The She by The Breeders, um, Backseat Driver by The Mega Corridor, I Am A Thousand Or So by Dr. VZX Moist, and uh, The Green Grocer by Paul Vickers in the Leg as well. Right, so, yeah, so I guess we're now on to the, the last album you guys have had out, which is Jump. Um, yeah. So for that album, before that was recorded, you guys expand, well, so that was for well, that was 2019 that came out. So that was a fair gap between that and the Green Grocer. But um, yeah. so you had to, so you had the whole thing with the like weren't playing live for a while, and then when he came back, he came back with like two new members. So you had James, who we talked about before, and then John, who we also mentioned before, who was in yeah. Kaya and Desk. How did yeah. it come about that it was going to expand into the bigger lineup? Well, what happened was basically John the do- John left in. Well, it was we worked it out at the time, which was maybe about three or four years ago that it had been 13 years since John left our kind of band thing. And I was, we never, we, the reason why the leg didn't have a bass player originally was because we couldn't really, we, we did try with other people, but it didn't really work out. And then we realized with the cello and stuff like that, that we didn't, we could sort of carry on going without bass and it worked very well, but it was difficult sometimes 
in terms of singing and stuff like that. But really what happened was that John decided, he, he said like uh, his life was such that he wanted to, he was always on this, he was coming to the gigs and stuff like that. He left for personal reasons. And then his life was such, he wanted to get back into it. And the door had always been open for him because he was the first person I played music with. I met him when I was 17 and he's like 10 years older than I am. But I met him when I was 17. One of the first people I met when I was in Edinburgh was quite, kind of very important in like getting Kaya going and things like that. And uh, so the door was always open for him whenever he wanted to come back because we basically just couldn't replace him as a bass player. So when he wanted to come back, we were working on a record, but it was for various reasons. It, it was we kept redoing things and stuff like that. And then, and then John sort of sort of reappearing on the scene was the perfect time because I've been making music with James for ages, with tidy grades and stuff like that, and just hanging out. And it was just the perfect time to bring James in as well, um, thinking maybe that I would play less guitar and sing more because it's much easier it's it's different playing the guitar and singing is different from just singing um, definitely you know um but I'm not really a singer you know I'm fundamentally a guitarist and so dropping my guitar wasn't as kind of easy as I thought it would be um it was just the right time for all those things to come together you know yeah, it's true with John as well, is that he fits like a, a glove. He does, because he's been there from the beginning. He's a great bass player, a lovely dude as well. Like, um, yeah. I've had, had a couple of chats with John, because um, before, well, lock, before lockdown, kind of like, obviously, COVID and stuff all happened and everything, like, I bumped into work a couple of times because um, yeah, he was in the that, that yeah. I work in. So I had a couple of chats with him and stuff, just walking the one, because nobody's seen him at the gigs and stuff. But that was, because yeah, uh, I remember. I remember the council, don't you? Yeah, so basically, like, yeah, we basically we spoke into a couple of there, and I remember um, he's, he's a great player, like, but I, and I remember, I, yeah, it's nice that I know the feelings mutual with him because I remember, like, um, when I put the leg on, well, finally, when I finally managed to get, because this was a thing going for a while, I remember when I finally managed to get the leg on for a gig, I remember end of 2018, kind of, when Fast Bit was kind of becoming a bit more serious and I was doing a bit more gigs and stuff, and that was a really cool gig, I remember really enjoying that because Jack Weir played and he was great and that was a good set yeah. for Moist and I remember you guys were awesome and it was funny because I remember speaking to John afterwards and you know, and John was saying, John, I think his words were, that was some interesting bass playing because my style's quite different from his, so like, he's a good dude. And it's well, nice I mean, I'm sure John won't mind me saying that basically yeah. he likes, he, he, well, him, as we were talking about Rush earlier on, I mean, him and Pete, he loves Rush and he loves things that we would probably shy away from, like you two. <laughs> but then he loves things that we love, like, like one of the, the best, what I always love is The Cure. Uh, the Cure, The Cure are awesome. Early Cure stuff, you know. So me and John always connected on that, not on the Rush thing, but we always connected on The Cure and things like that. It's a great um, band to connect on, like particularly like yeah. Pornography and Disintegration are like phenomenal albums. Like, yeah. They have, the have their patcher well, moments, The Cure, like, but those two are great. Like, and same with Head on the yeah. Door is cool as well. And the, what's the early stuff? Free Imaginary Boys and... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the, all cool the, stuff. They were the they the Cure were the sort of first band that I really kind of like. I don't know what, what the best. It, it seems a bit wrong to describe stuff as alternative these days. What with the alt right and all that kind of thing, but sort of alternative bands bef like pre Nirvana. You know, like like um, the Cure was the first sort of band that I really got into that was my own thing that wasn't like the Beatles or Bob Dylan or whatever that my parents were into, you know? Um, and I, I loved them. I used to, when I, like, when I lived in the Forest of Dean, I used to just, like, go to sleep at night, just looking out the window, listening to The Cure. It's just amazing. amazing. Did you listen to, listen to Lullaby by any chance when you did that, or, like, or different stuff? Because Lullaby would have been a good one for that. That's maybe the obvious choice. <laughs> the one that I remember really listening to is, like, 17 Seconds. That was that the second album? Something like that. Something it's like that. Definitely, it's definitely early. Like, yeah, they've got loads of albums. The Cure, like, it's hard to connect. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I really like "Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me." Oh, yeah, that's a bit later. Really, really, a bit that, late. It I seems early a... now, but it's a bit. It's actually a bit later. I think like, I, just... I like the really early stuff. Yeah, we, 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 we could, they were more punkier because they kind of evolved into like a more kind of post punky goth kind of thing later with Kiss Me Kiss Me that's kind of their pop album it's interesting to hear exactly, you say yeah. that Paul because I've got that on CD I own Pornography that one and uh, 
disintegration. I love pornography disintegration, but kiss me, kiss me. I like some of the songs in it like a lot. Like wet, what's it? There's that is it hot hot or wet wet wet? There's a good sort of funky song in that. And yeah. then there's just like heaven, which is an amazing song. The Dinosaur Jr. Yeah. cover that's amazing as well. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, there's good songs on it, but it's a bit bloated. Like it's too long almost. And I yeah. don't know. I don't think it's I don't think it's as sonically interesting as other albums. I feel like became... I feel there's something good in there. It just could have been a bit more they streamlined. Be... And Later easier, on, so. they became really like. There's loads of stuff in it, but I love the early stuff when there's not very much in it. They've got a song called Killing an Arab. That's a really good one, actually, from really early well, on. Well, like, I think that was their first single, actually. That's a really cool song. That comes from the Albert Camus. Uh, I just well, it doesn't have the outside. I'm just glad that I remember that album coming out, I suppose. Uh, the, yeah, but, but yeah. Uh, Killing an Arab. So it, it, do you know that book by Albert Camus? I don't know. I just, I just know. I just know the song, and I remember it again. Basically, it's called, says, says, story, like it basically like says the story of that where the guy basically shoots an Arab, but it's not really got anything to do with the fact that he's an Arab. He just wanted to see what it was like to shoot someone. Basically, it was great at that time, though, because you had like Julian Cope as well. Well, I, I wasn't. I wasn't. I don't really know Julian. I, I don't came know to Julian that Cope. Maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe, I, maybe, I, maybe, I, maybe that's because of my age. I don't really know Julian Cope. <laughs> Julian Cope. Well, there's there's another we know that. we could talk about, but I, I'm not a big fan of Julian Cope. I'm not, I don't dislike him, but I've never been a big fan. But he does have a good song called "Cunts Can Fuck Off," which that is amazing. I'm sold already. It's an amazing song. I would definitely check it out. I don't think he's ever recorded it as a a, a proper song, but there's like live versions of him doing it. And um, oh, there's loads of good Julian Cope. Yeah. Songs. Well, I don't know about that. But I, I, I do I'll, like I'll, Julian Cope as a person. On, on Dope and Speed is a really good as a person, he's, he's as a as a character, he's, he's he's amazing. But I've never been into Julian Cope's Joe Kill, Peggy Suicide, incredible <laughs> albums in my opinion. But the, uh, he was one of the few people to actually review Itchy Grumble. Never the issue, guys. His favorite, isn't it? <laughs> like we've like we've talked about expanding. We've totally just gone back to like Itchy yeah, Grumble. yeah. I mean the itchy grumble thing, yeah. So if, I think the impression. I think that, I'm, we could talk about it all night. Like, I think the impression is for anyone like who might be listening to this when I when I does when it does when it does come out like <laughs> go listen to itchy, itchy grumble. Yeah. Um. But anyway, so, so so back so back to back to the new well the new one jump. Um. So we we'll expand into into the bigger lineup and stuff. Um. And everything. So how did how did that like impact like how? But like you said you were writing that album already. How did that impact? Well, I, okay. The, well, first of all, I would say I would say that when we were making the demos for Jump. We didn't have the expanded lineup, right? Um, I mean, can I just say that James is actually like Donald Ross Skinner? Who the fuck's that? And Donald Ross Skinner was like the the, the main guitarist with Julian Cope. Ah, okay. Do you mean you mean in terms of style or what? You, or Stylistically, like... I think he's actually quite like him. Yeah. Mm. Um, I've never. I've only just. Well, I've only come to that realization now. But he is actually quite similar to him. That's interesting. I, I, I didn't I know that. But I don't really know Julian Coke, but so that's definitely homework for me when when this is finished. Yeah, maybe Ronald Ross Skinner, like all the best Julian Coke stuff is with him, um, and uh, he's yeah, he's quite a lot of effects, but quite spacey and sort of. Um, yeah. I can see that James James likes his pedals. Like everybody told me, he had like a drawer full of pedals or something. Like it's more than a drawer. So. Well, there's an interesting thing, Stuart, yeah. right? So. About, we're talking about pedals, right? In that the leg was basically always a very anti-pedal band. Me and Pete always use like two distortion pedals each, right? One set to like sort of like low, one set to high, and that's it. Like it's amp sounds, and that's still quite important. And then when we made the jump and the leg record, the chromatic perversion, we're like, right, yeah, we'll use pedals as a kind of different different thing. Ah, cool. But I do kind of like I do like feel like on that subject to say that like i am quite anti-pedals i like pedals i like pedals but just for us i feel like it's sort of like not uh, it's the same as like we don't use reverb on things we only use the room sound and stuff for you, for you guys it makes sense because you're quite a direct and quite raw kind of band in a lot of ways yeah, so, exactly, so so yeah, so exactly. it could have so, have, so do, having that approach makes a lot of sense for stuff like what you that and everything yeah. as well so a lot of bands were like sometimes like you know yeah like sometimes a lot of pedals work for a lot of bands other times like yeah. yeah, having a normal setup works really well, but and sometimes I think some of those bands get it wrong. Sometimes they could have to need to yeah, <laughs> scale yeah, down what they've got. Whereas other times, like they maybe have like you know they could be adding another thing, and it depends on the thing. It depends on what you're doing. It's so. an issue. I, I find I, I I do consider it a sort of issue, that kind of thing. It's like it's good when people have like the their 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 
effects that they that they use and they're the fundamental kind of go-to things and they're part of their sounds but effects as a kind of effects pedals as a kind of thing it's like that's that that's okay but it's not for it's not what you know like the leg was very much about not using that that kind of stuff and it just being very raw like i get what you mean because i mean for for ages like when I, well it's definitely i mean you're a bass as well to play guitar because it's more of a there's more of a thing for guitarists to use pedals over bass and stuff like also it's more of yeah. a it's, it's still plenty of stuff as well but i found certainly when i started out kind of playing and stuff i didn't use anything at all and then when i started playing like, you know, like moist and stuff then like I used a couple, but kind of very kind of like basic. I had like my distortion and my fuzz pedal because that's kind of what the bass sound was. We were having like you know like yeah. on which all the time, right. and then I had I a and then, and then and I had a wah because you're a free piece. You you, you kind of need to go into sort of some of this kind of go to other sonic territories and stuff. So I had that then, but for years that's all I used, just like those two. And like you get exactly. so many sounds you can get out of just like two pedals. I really I really know those pedals because I just yeah, had the two. Yeah, I expanded to I expanded, I expanded to a delay later on as well for a cup for like a for like a song. But even then on that on that band's material, like only one song has the i think there's, maybe, there's a cover we do as well but yeah in general there's like i, I only explain that kind of later i've kept that same setup yeah and i've almost done a 180 with another band i've kind of gone back to the distortion and the the, the delay and then when i do yeah. solo stuff i've just take t- t- it out completely because i'm like i have no need for this it's just it's just me there's no need well for i it, noticed so. that listening to your listening, you're doing, to your, so. listening to that thing you did recently i really enjoyed that thanks very much man there's not very there's not very many effects on that at all there's not a, it's not a single it's actually me yeah, I, 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 yeah. I, I plugged into i plugged into a tuner and then into the amp that's that's it yeah if it sends it as anything it's been um, there's a couple of different there's like we recorded like the amp and then um and then nor else is difficult like the room a bit as well with a condenser mic and yeah, stuff you can like, hear that, so yeah. that's what's just blended together basically so yeah yeah so yeah that, that was that was all clean just through the amp again using the amp sounds like you were saying so which which is what i'm quite into at the moment like yeah just, like, yeah i mean like, like clean and you know like, like that. i like i like effects and i realize why people use them and they can be used very creatively and and, and things like that but it's yeah it's definitely sort of like like not a leg thing really to use lots of effects i think that did did open up kind of like my bloody valentine kind of layer of yeah it was, it, it was very interesting when we were doing like for example on jump as we're talking about on there's a song called do your best on it and that was an interesting one because yeah james's uh effects pedals are very important on that and then when pete did the cello he sent us a uh a mix a version that he'd done when he put he'd done the cello over the top and it was like it was very odd because you had the sort of my bloody valentine type kind of guitar and then you had the sort of very folky almost cello on the top and it took a while to figure out how to sort of like blend the two and make them work they sound, it sounded very uh, odds to begin with didn't it and yeah it quite, quite a thing but then i don't know what pete did with the effects somehow brought the two together that's quickly it works well because again he's, he's done a great job of recording that one i'd say as well and it's like particularly with though there's because there's extra elements because obviously you can get used i guess he's probably got used to recording you guys when it was just like the three and four of you when it's with paul as well so yeah. to, to have to deal with two extra elements it sounds like quite a interesting challenge for him i'm sure he loved that sonically like figuring that out and like I'm sure he probably had his moments like, oh, this, 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 yeah. this is horrible yeah. but like I'm, I'm sure there's moments where he was like that's quite fun to mix it because that's the other thing with speaking to pete as well is this something i want to ask too because because with, with it's just for you before without, without john like i don't know four of us you get good probably I mean, in terms of the instruments and stuff like quite often than pete's cello was playing like a quite a bassy kind of role for like a lot yeah, of like exactly. early so like like stuff roles, yeah because yeah, i thought that because when i because i've seen you guys before there's moments like on that song center of the universe or or just other ones where you could have like he plays more of a cello thing but there's other moments where he like he turns into almost like a weak guitar player and starts like shredding yeah, and exactly, stuff which wouldn't yeah. be possible in the earlier leg material wouldn't it because he had to kind of hold down the, the, the bass yeah, end exactly so. yeah 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 so it opens you guys up quite a lot i i I, th- I think but i mean i don't know how that was for yeah, you guys I don't, yeah, know how, yeah. I don't know how that was was it easy to move pete out of that well was it easy to move out of that role and then go well, John's it, wasn't, doing it, wasn't, that now, it or... wasn't really conscious it wasn't really a conscious <laughs> thing like uh pete's out in perth i mean we don't we don't get to get together with pete as much as we would like to and i like making music with other people in a room together so yeah, it wasn't really a conscious. It wasn't really a conscious thing to do that. Like you know, did like did like his parts change? Because he said he demoed them initially. Some of the- I'd say it. Did, I'd say I'd say it would 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 change. I mean, I mean, to a certain degree, we're still figuring that out. 
Yeah, but I mean, like when you you said you demoed the songs initially with like um with alt with you know before he expanded and stuff was he did he yeah like, well, well when I say parts? that when I say that when, when I say that we we demoed that the way that we work is that me and Paul will make demos in Garage Band, right? Just the t- just the two of us and whoever's around. Ah, uh, okay. So yeah, so you did you demoed it. So the demos were with you guys and stuff. So yeah, yeah. So when Pete came to jump. It was more like he was adding, like, well, he was producing it as a, an engineer, but he was also adding, like, ornamentation, if you like. So, I mean, I, su- I suppose the thing is, is that what, what's very much on our mind, because we're making another record at the moment, is that always in the past, we left, like, I'd left lots of space for Pete. Whereas, whereas now it's sort of like um, there's not so much space for any that shit that and then so that kind of like influenced how that sounded. Yeah, and I, I think that that's been a, I think to some, you you know to make sure there's enough room for everyone in the in the in the sound picture because there's obviously only so much space and we just about managed it with jump, but there was a lot on the cake if you know what I mean. Um, a lot on the cake. Well, it's quite yeah. Well, do you know? Do you not mean a lot? Do you not mean a lot on the trifle? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a busy trifle. It's a busy trifle, and like when we took it to Pete, it was already it was already wobbling, and you know, I think he he did well in what he did, um, but it was a slightly different role that he'd have to play. I, I I'll be honest with you. I haven't really listened to Jump since we made it. Uh, the ones that I have listened to is Christmas in the Jungle because we keep like sort of sending it out at Christmas and stuff like that, and I'm quite, I'm quite pleased when I hear it. That's a fun wee song, actually. That was the first song you guys put out from that, wasn't it? Because I remember, yeah, I remember seeing that on SoundCloud or something before the album came out, and like, this is quite cool. Yeah, well, Chief in the Paradise was first, but I think the the it's our most produced album. And Jump is definitely the most. Well, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. In terms of like how much there is on it, is what I mean. There's more on it. There's not more on it because because um, the thing about having a, a sort of expanded lineup, right, is that whereas in the past, you know, you make a song and it'd be like the bass. There's you know this bass is lacking here, or this needs some something here or there, like. The idea with an expanded lineup was to be able to do everything live in one one off one take. Because I really, to me, like I want to do the least amount of overdubs possible. I want it to be live. I want it to be like a sort of representation of like the human fucking nervous system, right? I see. He always does a good job of capturing what you guys sound like um, live. Because certainly, like, because I'd heard the songs off a of jump. But yeah, I'd heard so. Yeah, because I remember when I put, yeah when I put you guys on and seen you play. I'd seen you play the songs before I heard the album. Yeah, I think I, I think it's a good representation of the. Do you of, think it's of, a good representation? Of, of oh, right. yeah. it, it, it is a bit it is a bit cleaner than say like itchy and stuff. Like for instance, yeah. as we're talking about that stuff as well, and the rare ones. But um, but no, that's because it's the vibe of it. Because it is I'd say it's a pop. It's it's a pop. There's more pop. There's some more pop elements in it. Because a pop. It's like a poppier record overall. It's still yeah. very much you guys, and it's quite off kilter and quite bizarre and stuff. And it has like these weird changes and everything. So it's still very much a leg hold a leg record at its core. But it definitely does have. So it's got this for- terrible, terrible kind of flourishes that it didn't have before. The effects yeah. with James and stuff, and then I it's also kind of like it. it's quite like um, it's also got these kind of these kind of hooks and stuff. Like it's got like, some more pop of hooks in it. It's a good thing to move. It's a different record from before. Oh, I'm from before, yeah. and it's well, every, it's good for you guys to be trying to move sort of go forward. So certainly, every record that we make, we definitely want it to have a sort of like a different. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't want to say like completely different approach, but like uh, sort of like it, it does always have every record I've ever made has a sort of its own references and its own sort of like uh, like vibe to it. And sometimes you want to be more. Sometimes you want to be more sort of like try and make it a bit more accessible. And sometimes you want to like sort of you know intentionally repulse people it's definitely the most accessible one out of the four i would say yeah, but that's that's kind of a good thing I, I think i think like because I, I really i really i think it's great and stuff like that i think i wasn't i think i yeah i i spun the vinyl the other day like the other day actually like that, 
Yeah, the I like job's that. great. Like, and I think if someone, if I was to say to someone, like, I think it depends on where you want to put them. I think if someone had never heard you guys before at all, I'd probably say that's probably the easiest one to kind of hear yeah, and get yeah, into. Yeah. I'd probably direct them to that first before telling them to the other stuff. But it depends on what they like. If someone said to me, well, I like really like experimental and out there, get it more, like, I don't know, more. Yeah. It depends what someone like. If someone, someone's into more, you know, I mean, seeing you guys play or something and then kind of like, oh, I want to check, check out more of this stuff. I don't know. I maybe put them more towards maybe, say, I guess it depends because I wouldn't be split. Itchy would fall. That was the first one of you guys I heard. I don't know if it's where I put yeah. people first. Does that make sense? I think Tropical Favorites is a good starting point as well for you guys, I right. would say. It depends right. on where I want you want to put the person. I think, like, in terms of getting into, I'd say the way, the, yeah, jump is the easiest, is a good, is a really good starting point. And then work. Yeah, I would have thought but there so, is stuff. Yeah. But I would I mean, say. Yeah, but I think that's kind of like. But the equal Tropical actually, Favorites yeah. is a good starting point too, depending on what people like, maybe, I would say. So. I would say, I, I, well, I'd like to think anyway that we're better at what we do now and we're better at like sort of uh executing what we do and putting it ac across properly and would like nothing we ever did was ever meant to be sort of abrasive and annoying or anything like that you know uh it was always meant to be <laughs> like music that people would like and kind of poppy uh but we also had this kind of thing where we you know we like making noise and we like doing weird shit um i do think on jump we you got a good balance of it i think sherbet yeah, and chili's yeah, sherbet and chili's yeah. a perfect it's example good. of that i would yeah, say that's sherbet. that's what I, I really like that one a lot actually i guess probably my favorite song on the album that one actually i really like sherbet, sherbet and chili, and chili. Oh, yeah yeah because well, it's a it's, great it's, bit in it in the middle where it kind of drops down every everybody mutes their guitars like does a palm muting thing and plays one note i'm so that's one of my favorite bits on anything we've it's ever it's really done. good it's like so that, effective yeah because the thing with that i like with that one is it starts off quite aggressive and then it's all like chill and lovely and it really yeah. it really shows the two sides of the it's well not two sides because obviously you do more but it shows a really good side of that abrasive yeah. stuff just basically yeah. what you were saying i think if someone said oh show me a song that really kind of shows you what paul and the like capsulate in a song i think that's a really good example yeah, and that makes sense. Like no, it really it gives you a range if of. You only, uh, if you only choose choose one song, then that wouldn't be a bad. Yeah, yeah well, well, it, well it's, it's it's a good it's a good thing that after this bit to to end the show that uh, we're playing, I'm going to put Sherbet and Chili on. So it's a good okay. thing. We, we picked that. It's a good. It's I'm, I picked that one. I almost put Christmas in the Jungle, but then I changed it to this one. So uh, so it sounds like it's worked out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Christmas in the Jungle is is starting to feel like a Christmas song that shouldn't be on a record to me. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, Sherbet and Chili is just it does encapsulate pretty much everything yeah i'll need to send you i've got a wee video actually on my um when i put you guys on on my instagram it's funny because i didn't know the names of the song of these ones songs at the time so i just filmed you guys playing a bit of your set i was quite into and i was remember thinking i wonder what song on the album this is and it was sherbert and chili ah, right. just like from a get-go just i just filmed a bit i was quite enjoying like a minute and a bit of it and then yeah. um I'll, I'll i'll link it to you after this actually yeah yeah that'd be great. it's just it's just a wee short clip on my phone it's nothing like that exciting but it's uh, yeah. it's a nice wee clip and it's kind of funny because it's just like yeah that was a moment i really enjoyed at the set and then yeah it wasn't the album and you're like it's that one and again it's nice that like you know that's one that i've picked and then you guys are like oh that yeah. song you know we're really proud of it. it's, it's nice when these things work out coincidentally it yeah. almost sounds like we've planned this more than we have to be <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah or maybe just some songs are better than others <laughs> God, it's starting to, it's starting to sound like animal farm now isn't it like uh some so all songs are equal but some songs are more equal than others yeah yeah should have been should have been a single really maybe that's the one we should make well everything's been fucked by the fucking coronavirus hasn't it perfect like, I mean, per perfect segue because the next thing i want to ask was how you were talking we talked about it a bit before about covid impacting your summer years well you're saying you guys could still you could form a bubble you can still meet up and do your demo in as you were doing before and um, but has it changed anything apart from obviously being the delays of getting other, the other guys in has it changed anything else about how you'd approach composing songs and stuff or uh, i would say that it's probably <sighs> Oh, that's a difficult one. I mean, from like, the point of view of time, it's been really good because I haven't been at work. I've been furloughed, so like from a time point of view, it's been great to like really spend. But it hasn't. Time. But 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 it doesn't really mean that we've done anything differently. Really, I mean, me and Paul have been able to carry on working in the way that we always have done. It hasn't really hasn't really changed that, but it has changed in that like. Um, uh, I mean, it's changed, and I hope it's not a permanent change, but I mean, Alan's adding stuff 
like recording stuff on his phone and sending it through and stuff like that and it's not the same as being in a room together something like, I, mean, I miss so much about, about music just now is just like you know yeah you, you can write things you can trade stuff with people or whatever but being in the same room with people it's it's so it's just it's yeah, yeah it's more organic know, and it feels nicer about so. playing music something about playing music with people like a group of people playing music together it's like a whole notion of being in bands and stuff like that is kind of silly it's 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 not really about that it's about playing music together and you play a song over and over again every time you do it it's different and every time it develops and the that's what i miss like i mean i want I'm, to be I'm, i desperately same. desperately desperately just want to be in a room with my fucking friends play, playing playing music together playing the same song over and over and over again like that's, play, what's, play, that's what's different about it just play music together and like having like a and have like you know you have your squabbles but you also have your laughs and you know it's all part yeah, of yeah yeah and you, and yeah, you, like, you bond together because the thing about being in a band is it's like you feed off each other and like sometimes you can like on your own you're kind of like or when there's even just a couple you might be like is this any good or not are we just in our own heads and then so you show it to other people and then you bounce yeah, off like, yeah yeah people, people like, can always there's... sometimes know how to take your idea a certain way that like you might go oh Right, for instance, basically, you might go, okay, well, it's going to go C A, but then where does it go after that? And yeah, so, it's a well, you could do this like filter. thing for six bars, and then you know, it's, there's the things that it's, it's an example. You can have you know. more confidence in what you're doing if you know that it's gone through this like really sort of like sort of tough filter. Like so, so like it's like, like I'll, I'll write songs. I'll, well, it is like it is like your friends are an audience, yeah, and your band is an audience. It's like so I can write, I could write a song, like every day when i wake up but most most of the time it would be shit it's only when it's gone through this sort of process of playing it to other people now it's not always about like <clears throat> i had this argument with kira she thinks that we're all just patting each other on the back all the time but it re that really is not the case it's not about what when people say that's great that's cool it's not about that it's about what you feel in a room when people don't say anything that's how you know it's a it's a, a good idea to pursue and stuff like that right it's what people don't say when you're in the room with them that's an interesting way to look at it i've never thought about it like that like but that's that's actually pretty good i mean about that think about that before. that's pretty good actually yeah for me that's how it, that's how it is i mean it's like it's like yeah everybody can go oh yeah great great right but that's not that's 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 not what like you know when you play something you've made to other people in the room it's what they don't say that and I, and it's how you feel that how you know and so a band gives you that it gives you that filter it gives you this filter people who have like a kind of like shared sort of interest in it being good but one you know, interesting thing that has happened though is that I think like the relationship between me and you as songwriters is closer with this new album than it has been, uh, which is good because we've had the time and the space to do that. And also I made the conscious decision with this new album, which you haven't even heard yet, to be a lot more personal with the like the lyrics. And it's it's actually like a lot more about, and it's what, weirder than fucking real life. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you're gonna you're gonna get I mean, to like bear your soul a bit more. Not, not I like that. It's it's yeah. funny actually. So to break to, onto what you were saying, Paul, there just because I remember I, I want to bring this up because I read this I read this the other day and it reminded me. And I'm glad I read this earlier because I, I just I thought this was really funny. There's that interview that you did with Neil Cooper where um where you say um oh uh, I used to a bit I was used to a bit like evil Coldplay, but I now sound like Shirley Bassey. <laughs> Yeah, and, that was an and, 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 and I thought that was pretty funny because that's interesting, then because I, I was I was wondering about that. I was like, what does it, how does he mean by that? I just thought, yeah. I just thought it was funny. So, yeah, so, like, what, so, so, what, so, what do you mean by like, so more like, that was more Paul, so. like Dawn of the Replicants to the leg, and it was more right. about my singing style because, like, what I was saying earlier, which none of you believed, was that I was a bit more of a choir boy. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, <laughs> yeah, good kid i'm glad you're hearing this as well but if you if you listen to like the first dawn of the replicants album and you listen to my vocals on that album they're a lot 
soft. I need to listen to that. I've not, I've, I don't think I've heard. What was the first one? I don't think I've heard that it's one. Called one head, two arms, two legs. That, that happens with everyone. I think it's I've got heard that a one. candle fire on it. It's got all the sort of the ones that you know got well, signed. Song, well, basically, that, 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 the thing that, what all that meant is we were like, we, we, you know, there was a purity to it in that sense. But I actually think I'm a better singer now. But it's much more. It's more visceral, and it's more sort of like, you know, there's more of my personality in it. Whereas, like, I think to start with, when you start doing music as a young person, you sort of like you sleepwalk into things a bit more, and it's sort of there's elements of when I look back and I sort of think sometimes think I don't do that anymore. Maybe I should do a bit of that and a bit of what I do. Well, with well, the new and stuff like, we've been doing, I've well, been encouraging you. Yeah, there's much more of a melodic sense in the new stuff where I have gone a wee bit back to that 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 softer style of of singing, and also like I think the two of us have been quite careful with it um, in terms of like um, the decisions we've made. Um, yeah, you're gonna love the new one. Fuck. I'm looking forward to it because in the, the day, like you know, I you know I, I love what you guys do, you know, like and you're you're on third bands to see live and stuff, you know, and I think the like are really you know, the like and then Paul like because we're talking about two different bands effectively here, that you know they're both really yeah. unique and interesting bands. I think you know I, I love you, you guys both a lot, and I think like so with the vocal delivery, like there's no one else sings like for Paul, for instance, no one no one else sings like you. Like I think like there's just like, there's just this sort of like weird like. Yeah, pretty surely passing almost this thing. It's like there's yeah. I can't think of I can't I can't name like other vocalists where I can like go, oh, he sounds like that. I just well, it's like, totally, like, honestly crazy there's, there's thing, so. like Paul is a is a so. I mean, we all are everybody is a totally unique person, but, but definitely when it comes to Paul singing, I mean it is totally fucking unique. But I think what's happened with this new set of songs is that um it's like the, we have this thing about we talk about Susan Oblong songs. And what we mean by that is like the sort of really angular, sort of like deliberately sort of abrasive kind of, you know, not like anything else kind of songs. Whereas there's, there's definite aspects where it re really focused on the idea of like, put, put your heart on the table and actually really tell the actual story that's occurring, if you see what I mean. There's one song, on the, there's one song that we've been doing and uh, George from Tenement, said that uh it sounded like abba <laughs> <laughs> which it doesn't See, actually no, but... Abba, some, some abba is banging like i i own vooly voo on vinyl and i i, I think it's a great album <laughs> i, like I quite like abba vooly voo is awesome does your, mother, does, your mother, does, your, sorry, does your mother know is an absolute banger <laughs> and so is vooly voo those songs are like bangers undisputable <laughs> yeah well i think it it, yeah, it's going to be interesting when we get when we get this. We get There's this. some heartfelt songs on the new one. We <laughs> haven't got. We're slowly moving, slowly moving away from the ABBA comparison. Yeah, I can feel the rage inside you, Dan. You're just like, very perceptive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah well, I guess. Sit well with me, no. Yeah, it's just, that's fair. everyone's well, unique. Certain things that Abba say that I think are right. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was a point where, like, um, they were, they were interviewing what they called the two Bennies or whatever they called, where they, they said to them, like, you know, you, when you write a pop song, you need like a hook, and they said to them, no, that's not right. You need, you need a hook for every two lines. Ah. And that's like that's an extreme. Was, 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 it, was it the Bennies from Abba said that, or uh... they said that? Yeah, they said every two lines you need another. Was, they're both called Benny, the two guys in Abba, or I like... always think they are called both called Benny. So, because I don't think they were, but I they maybe they are called Benny, but I think of them as both being called Benny. But I think you know they were very, they knew what they were doing. They were meticulous about it. You know, um... have you ever seen the show um, Rock Profile? Um, the guys in Little Britain did before they did Little Britain because in that they do parodies of like various musicians and stuff. And there's one where they do ABBA, and the two guys are talking about how they think their songs are all about like are all like political statements and everything. And they're and they're, and they're like, oh, it's all about like these serious issues. And you're just like, what? Because <laughs> <laughs> they are just fun pop songs. And all like, yeah, no, they are ultimately. Yeah, yeah. But like, um, I 
to me at the end of the day though like when, when you're writing a song the most nerve-wracking thing about writing a song is when you sat in a room and there's nothing there at all and then you have to pull something into the room and like david lynch says a lot of interesting things about creativity on this front where he says that like um all the ideas that he will have throughout his entire life are all trapped in one room, but he doesn't have access to them yet. And all that he I feel like that, Jesus. And, and all that he feels he gets is little bits here and there. Yeah. David Lynch exactly slowly what through. Exactly what I'm not seeing all this. Sometimes stuff. when he gets the little bits, he doesn't know how to assemble them, or he doesn't know why he's only getting that bit and not the <laughs> And that it makes sense. It's taking his whole yeah. life to actually work out a lot of his own work. If you see that, that's exactly that what makes sense. That makes sense because his films confuse me. I've not seen all of them. I've seen a few of them, but they're but the ones I've seen, I really like. They're great, but you don't know what the hell's going on in them. Like, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite the magic. We could go into like a longer conversation about that, but um, one thing speaking of David Lynch actually ties in nicely. I wasn't going to ask about this, but you've mentioned it now, Paul. So it's good to actually discuss this. You and your brother have a David Lynch theme, or is it not yours, but your brother is helping you with it? You've got a David Lynch theme. Oh, wait, theme. So like a play that I'm doing about David Lynch. Yeah, 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 yeah which is that a terrible is... idea. It hasn't been finished yet, but it's it's in production. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll give as well, while we're talking about this, we'll give your brother a wee shout as well. So that's Stephen Vickers, if anyone knows who he is. And Steve plays in the, the Victor Pope band, who are, who are pretty great and they're pretty fun. Um, so it's where and he does midlife crisis and stuff as well, because rap stuff. So it's worth giving Steve a wee, a wee shout here. But Steve's a lovely guy as well, so we Ooh. should. Yeah, the king of leaf. Anyways, so the two things I want, there's two more things I want to ask you guys about uh, in this as well. And so the first one, I guess we'll do, we'll do the whole thing I've been doing, well, I'm going to try and do on these where we talk about like, where I get, where I basically get the people I'm interviewing to basically recommend another act that they really, they, you know, they're active the DIY scene that they really like. And so from speaking to you, they text Dan, you guys were saying you wanted to mention Andy Brown for that. Yeah. Uh, so, so tell us, so tell us a bit about Andy Brown and who is Andy Brown and what does he do? And uh, just a brief overview. Well, he's a he's a he's a wonderful, wonderful Edinburgh character. He's an amazing and, guy. And you know, full disclosure, he's been a friend of mine for years and years and years. Um, and he just he he just does lovely songs. He's not he doesn't put anything he does on the internet. Uh, he doesn't know how to. Uh, he just makes his songs and his poetry. And he's just lovely and brilliant. And I can't really say much more than that. He's a, he's a topper of a guy. He's always been super lovely to me the times I've met him. Like he's, he's you're right, a cat, there's a way to describe him. He's been to watch, you know, I, I bumped in a few times and he's been like, he'll talk about like birds and nature and things. It's just yeah, an interesting yeah. guy, like quite captivating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, he's a very good friend of mine. And, you know, he doesn't put anything online which is why I thought it would be a good person to play a bit of his music now, you know. Kirkyard Gothic, the one that he sent, it's like about, it's like poetry about what he feels sitting in a, a graveyard. Cool. Is that, is, it, is that his Victorian karaoke stuff? Does he always call his stuff? Victoria? Well, no, no. Not, not always. Like karaoke stuff is because Andy, he, um, he's done, he's a singer-songwriter, I suppose. And a poet, and a botanist, and uh, but when he when he some of his uh, songs he's done for gigs, like for example, I remember him playing at this club called Confusion and Sex of many years ago, and uh, he had uh, garden gnomes they collected or, or set in the front of the stage, <laughs> and uh, he was singing along to his own songs. The vocals weren't even taken off. The original mixes he was just singing along to them and just fantastic but i just love the fact that basically you know he, he just gets on with feathers didn't he where he used to like stroke gnomes with feathers uh, yeah he does yeah. and and but the, you know but he doesn't have anything online and he doesn't he doesn't really care about that kind of stuff that much although Maybe it does. I don't know. Well, well, I, I, I went for a quick go um search on online because uh, in case we didn't get anything, so I was like, I wonder if there's anything we can pull from somewhere. Uh, it's good we've got it though, because I, I, I found a couple. You could have like you know low quality YouTube videos of him, like they weren't oh, very right, long. Yeah. I found a I couple mean, of he's a well, 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 well loved character. 
I've se- I've seen him once before. I saw him at the Zed Penguin album launch once before, like playing like his his karaoke stuff, and it was it was it, I read his feathers as Paul was saying. He was it was really cool. So like I'm glad you picked him. He has so a beautiful, yeah. beautiful voice, like really beautiful deep voice. Um, Andy's great. Yeah, yeah. And and apparently there's a well, I mean he you, I mean you should talk to Andy because like you really should do like on a on a thing like this. But there's a Smith song that is. Possibly about Andy. Not that I'm a big fan of the Smiths, and obviously Morrissey. I, I, don't, care. I don't care. I don't. I don't care. I don't care for the Smiths. Morrissey's a Morrissey's a twat. I fucking can't stand him. I can't stand Morrissey. Gordy was a good guitar player, but I feel like Morrissey ruins all the songs with his oh, voice. Oh my god! Oh my god! I mean, this is a big debate, isn't it? These days, I mean, the Smiths kind of epitomise that. It's like what a disaster. We can go into that kind of time. Honestly, I could make a whole, I could make a whole like podcast <laughs> on on how much on, on how much I just like Morrissey and what he does with them and well, stuff. Well, like. Count me in on that one. Like, <laughs> we should maybe, we should maybe, we should maybe, we should maybe like whenever whenever out of ideas for a vote to interview, we should just like do a thing we talk about. <laughs> like how that. shit Morrissey is. Yeah. We could do ones where we talk about. Okay, yeah, so do, I'm thinking about doing what. If you have to remember I'll, that they were important. Yeah. To a certain generation, a certain type of people in, in a certain generation, that they probably do find it difficult to let Morrissey go. Yeah, because, but it because, needs to be done. It needs to be yeah, done. Yeah, what's the thing? I'd love to. I was thinking about doing one the other day where we do talk about like I know like ranking a, a band that people you know I and someone else really likes, and you know talk about their disco- their you know just their random other band like a bigger band, but. This idea of doing that so it sounds kind of fun as well. Like, well, it well, does. It does. It we'll does see. sound kind of fun, but I mean, it is really the time to spread positivity and not negativity. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe when we're right of lockdown, we can do like the negative <laughs> 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 ideas. Um, yeah. So, so that's so anyway. So, Andy Brown totally worth having a yeah, look at. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess absolutely. yeah. And which more is uh, which um, Smith songs about Andy Brown? Mm. Uh, I wouldn't really like to go into that story. But um, apparently, one of them's about Andy. Mm-hmm. I want to know what song that is. Well, that's a whole other podcast, isn't it? That's uh, our story. Um, so yeah, so basically, yeah, the last thing to discuss is tying it all back to what we're talking about. Earlier. It, all, it always seems to come back to H. Grumble, doesn't it? Um, so I noticed in June of this year because I, I I still have to listen to it properly. I listened to one of the chapters from it today to get the idea of of it. Uh, it was the audio book for H. Grumble. Oh, the audio book. Uh, now, yeah. So did enough, that. I have yeah. very fond memories of recording Lance as well. So did, did so did you record that like so it came out uh, June of last year? Did you yeah, record that's it? Because, that's because it was that, 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 we did it. We did it in about probably 2011, 2012, something like that. 2012 it would have been. I was living in Gorgi. Paul came around and stayed at mine for like three days. We drank red wine constantly. Recorded like if you listen to that, you can hear clinks, clinks of wine in the background. <laughs> but basically, you can, you like, can hear Dan skinning up, like, like um, you know, like uh, but yeah, but you read the whole book. It was wonderful. I mean, we have wonderful times like that. We have a really good working since relationship. It, since, since you guys have a very rich and wonderful friendship and it's really nice to well, hear you do, yes. it's nice to hear a bit more about that because you see it on stage a bit and I see you guys together and stuff but just it's re- I'm really seeing it like the most I think I've ever seen it just like yeah, talking to you guys it's think, really nice to see that so. people used to think that we that we that that we had some kind of issues with each other or whatever because we'd have that this kind of banter on stage but it's not <laughs> it's not it's not we're really really close but we, we, um, there has been times where we have actually had physical fights. <laughs> have we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That. Like that, that one about after the zombie walk, where like um... there's been the odd bad moment. <laughs> that, well, that is what happens. When it happens in all good friendships, doesn't it? You, 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 you can't have good times yeah. all the time. You got you got to have your tough moments, and then you then appreciate you really appreciate the good times afterwards. You yeah, know? I mean, like it's go, to me, it goes right back to. Um, you know, like you were saying about being mystical, about the fact that I, as a teenager, read Paul's reviews in a magazine, right? Yeah. And it, it's like, I don't want to be too mystical about it, but it does feel like it was my and Paul's relationship was meant to be. Yeah, I would say so, definitely. It's like you guys were destined to meet. Um, yeah, yeah. Also, how how many, uh, so how many years is that you guys have known each other for now? Like 20 or so or less? 2007. Or? So this is less than I thought. So like fourteen then. So yeah, I just assume. I just. I just. I just assume twenty because I know you've lived in Edinburgh for a while. For a Not while. twenty. No. So no. No. I just, no. I just, I just assume. Seven, that's still a long time though. Fourteen years. That's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we've been. We've been like 
we've had our ups and downs, as we were saying, but like um, we've been pretty close that whole time. I actually think as well, like what we were saying about the new album, I think in a way that's kind of like the most, yeah, actually the closest we've been writing an album, actually. And I think that it benefits a lot from that. So all the, like, the negativity of like lockdown and all the rest of it is kind of overrided by that factor for me. Whereas I feel like we've sort of overrided it. Because like, I think one of the biggest worries with lockdown is that you start writing loads of songs about lockdown. And that's what I thought as well, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. we haven't done that, you know. And that's... Yeah. It's hard to like, yeah, because that's, that's, what, that's, that's what you do and stuff. You just got to kind of, I guess, escape. And I find when I've been writing stuff, it's a big escape almost from this kind of world. Like you can just think about something really <laughs> fantastical and crazy, and like you always get you always get away away from it, and that's like quite quite a nice feeling. And I get the impression you guys have been doing that as well from what you've been yeah, saying. Yeah, I mean, it is about it is about getting away from it because I mean the lockdown's a really like, mental situation. It's shit. Like I mean, like I haven't seen my family for like over a year now. I mean, it, it's totally fucking shit, isn't it? I mean, what can you say? Like, but it just has to be done. It has to be done, and you have to know that we will come out of this. Mm. Hopefully soon. I mean, I mean, that, that's we'll, it. We'll, we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm hoping for some sort of like uh, DIY sort of outdoor kind of gigs in the summer. If I can, if if I'm able to do that, I'll definitely be arranging some stuff. Yeah, like that. yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I think, think you, I, I think you've been, I think you've been really. Like I have to say at this point that I'm really impressed by what you've done with uh, uh, the live streams and stuff. I mean, you really sort of like uh, did like the the live streams I did for you. I kind of felt like it was a gig and it was like a kind of sense of being with other people. And, you know, not everybody's doing that. So thank you for doing that. It's been just fucking great. Like it really, mm -hmm. made, really made a big difference. Things like that. And I like... I do what I do like about the lockdown and the situation is that you know there's this other way of doing things that is sort of maybe would have taken ten years, but now they're happening now. And you know, yeah. I thank you so much for doing that because it's like fucking made made a massive difference. Like you know. Well, thanks a lot, Dan. But it's again like this interview and like all the stuff there, like the streams and stuff. None of that is possible without like all the lovely talented musicians, like yourselves, to you know to to ask to do it. Because you know if you don't have lovely talented and also you know and just really good and nice, genuine well, humans and stuff to, to ask, you can't you can't make these things happen without you know, without yourselves. So you know, thanks for the music and making yeah, me yeah, want awesome, to do it as well. Awesome. So there's lots of there's lots of musicians. There's lots of great musicians. But it does. It's really good that you are doing what you do. Because there's a lot, hardly anybody doing what you you do, which is providing a platform for people to to to, to be a community and to do stuff. And, and it's like, uh, yeah, and it's a lot of work. I appreciate that. Like, I really do appreciate the work that you're putting in, and I, I think it's great. I think you're an absolute star. Man. Oh, thanks for thanks very thanks thanks very much, Dan. That's really nice of that's really nice of you saying stuff. So. Should that right? I think that's probably a good time to kind of we'll do the last we'll do the final plugs I think before and then that's a yeah. good time to sort of uh, to at least end the interview interview and stuff. So so basically next up uh, on the last section we'll play um like a, what was that Andy Brown song again um Kirkyard Gothic Kirkyard Gothic is cool. So we'll play yeah. Kirk, so yeah well yeah so right so, so we'll we'll play the Paul one so yeah so we'll play Paul's audiobook first a bit of that so we'll play Chapter Ten Little Sprites first off of that and then uh -huh. we'll play. Kirk and Gothic by Andy Brown, and then we'll play Sherbert and Chili by Paul and the Leg, and then that will end the end the podcast. So yeah, can so I, thanks. Can I just say a little thing that I want to say? Yeah, no worries. Robbie Basher, right? The yeah. thing about Robbie Basher and where connect him. Yeah. Uh, during the this time of lockdown, it's very lonely kind of music, but and you know I think we can all relate to that. And he's a great musician and all these things, but I also relate to him because nobody gave a fuck about him in his lifetime. Like, yeah, he died, he died tragically. Now, I read about that. Now people, people are like, fucking hell, there's this amazing music that people are going to forget about. Um, there's people in the world that are sort of like actively trying, because he had no family, he had no people, nobody gave a fuck about him. But the music, as you as you're saying, as you've heard, it's just like so fucking beautiful, and it needs people to keep his his, his memory alive. 
Yeah, I would say definitely. Like, that's another thing. Like, I know we talked about this before I recorded it, so, but definitely Robbie Basham. Uh, what was it? His name is Robbie. Did I pronounce that right? Robbie. Robbie Basham. Yeah, yeah. like, we played him like, earlier on in the thing. Definitely, like, yeah, if anyone's looking for some lovely, chill acoustic guitar, uh, acoustic guitar, but also kind of pushing you because, like, it's quite classical and, like, a steel yeah. guitar. It's quite cool. Yeah. Yeah, as, as you were saying, it's very, very, very lovely stuff. You can find it on Spotify, YouTube, et cetera. Definitely listen to him as well. And, um, yeah, but in terms of other things as well, yeah, so in terms of you guys, you can find yourselves on. Bandcamp, uh, like Paul and the, Paul Vickers and the Leg, and um, you can also find the Leg on Bandcamp as well. There's also plenty of YouTube videos, I'm sure, kicking around of the of the respective bands as well. There's the free live streams you did for me that are that are definitely also worth a look if anyone's looking for some good stuff too. It's on the Fuzzbite YouTube channel. There's Paul does Mr. Twonky, so definitely worth having a look at any of any of that stuff as well because that's that's all. There's a lot of that on YouTube as well, isn't there, Paul? Or Twonky yeah, stuff? no, there is this kind of clips from each of the shows. Um, yeah, like so I clips of each of the shows and yeah, take a look at that. And then everyone fancies a weird audio book. There's the oh, there's the <laughs> Itchy Grumble audio book. Can you buy the book? Actually, the way, like, can, I just say, can I just thing. say about Twonky as well? Yeah. Is that I personally like to see Twonky as performance art, not as comedy. Yeah, that's 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 that, that that's fair. I'd say it's a mixture of the two, but that's yeah, that's fair. But yeah, can you, I was going to say, can you, can you buy the book? Like, uh, on, can you buy the book at all? Yeah, there's a physical still, so book, a paperback book. But and yeah. where, can you, where, where can you buy that if anyone's interested? You can't anymore. You can't anymore. Why, you sold out? No, I know, you, you can still buy it from me, but like, I sell it at gigs. It actually sells well. I've sold quite a lot of copies of the book. Um, but like, at the time when I released the book as a paperback, I did like a book launch and I tried to get my mum's book group to read it, but she was like, <laughs> <laughs> "Well, maybe can, well, keep, well, can you keep can you keep a book aside for me, Paul, and I'll pick one up from you at some point." Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, I, I bought the audio book, but I'd be good to have a physical physical copy of it if it exists. So yeah, it's a nice little book. So yeah, so so yeah, so when gigs are a thing, go see Paul Vickers in the leg and ask Paul about his book. <laughs> Than just did so yeah, and you can check them out where I said. Uh, there's also Tenement Records that the leg or the, well, the yeah, uh, both like and Paul Leg are on, so it's worth giving them a yeah, it's worth giving them a look too. And yeah, and I'm sure if you if you dig deep, you can find the old other old stuff that Bill well, Dan and Paul have done. And I mean Pete's done loads of record; he's produced loads of things as well. So you can check out yeah. what he's done too on 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 the Pumpkinfield website too. Yeah, I think that's probably that's enough plugging. It feels weird to plug stuff when I'm not actually like I don't just I'm just talking to you guys and kind of pretending people are like listening as I'm doing this. Well, I, I don't know. I think I think that's what's good about the kind of live stream thing is is that in the lack of like sort of gigs and stuff like that, it's like it does feel like the, the live streams did feel like you were doing a gig. Yeah, it's not it's not quite the same, but it's def it's definitely like as close as we can get right now. And it's but like also, do you know what, what so. I think's good about it as well is that like. Um, like for example, a lot of the fuzzback stuff I've watched since, and I've really enjoyed it. It's a kind of like sort of whole other sort of form that didn't exist before, you know. Like um, it, it's not an album, it's not a gig. It's this other thing in the middle, you know. Yeah, there's there's other cool folk doing streams as well. There's like a guy called uh, Theo who does like noisier stuff, like the more noisy end of thing, like you know, usurper and stuff like that sort yeah. of thing. He puts on a bunch of stuff like that. That's on Twitch. A lot of folk be using Twitch for streams and stuff. Like oh, right, I've never, right. I've, I've I've never used that myself. I mean, I, I had a video that was on one of his ones, but I've never used that myself. And um, but there's lots of stuff. There's stuff on that. So I know they. He he he, he was doing he was doing even more than me. He was doing weekly ones for like. Oh, like right. ages. And he just got burnout from it, but you can't do that every week. Like you know, it's yeah. impossible. Have you, you, know, you have, have, heard, have you come across uh, Blind Boy? I haven't. No. Check out Blind Boy. It's not music. Well, some of it it is music orientated. Blind Boy, fucking amazing, absolutely amazing. Uh, Kira introduced me to this. Uh, just amazing podcasts. Amazing. Blind boys. What sort of stuff is he just discuss things on? on it? Yeah, he does. He does his kind of like uh, Irish hot takes, really, really good. Like, like really sort of like obscure connections between things, and it's like ah, really good. I honestly, I would just recommend that so much. Like, listen to Blind Boy. He's amazing. 
Oh, really? Well, that's that's probably a good note to end this bit on. So yeah, so thanks both for being for being for being on this and doing this with me and stuff. Well, thank you, thank you. And yeah, so so yeah, so in the podcast we'll just go to the the last few songs and then and then it will end. Itchy grumble. Chapter ten, little sprites. So whatever would become of me, Itchy Grumble, the great daredevil hero of that day. My body bobbed near an old oil drum. I was being eaten by maggots. And my decapitated head was several miles away. My remains drifted about a thousand miles off the coast of Ecuador. I guess you could say I was shot slightly wide of the mark. I suspect that my eventual whereabouts was never really taken into the equation when the foreman was hatching his master plan. All that mattered to him was the lighthouse ferris wheel, and not his little hero with balls of pig iron. It did not matter if I was dead or alive, and to the foreman... I was little more than an echo in the mind of an ant. I was slowly rotting away as the oil drum riddled with rust creaked in the dim moonlight. The situation was so desperate that our story could quite easily end here. But you all know of my immortality and it was not long before the marshland insects began their rescue. They whizzed across land and sea for thousands of miles to reach me, crawling all over me, glittering with their fluorescent lights, their snout beaks and walnut heads in a spin as glow milk covered every talon, sucking, licking, extracting, replacing, fiddling, lisping, towing, Fingering, pulsing, shaking, dancing, little sprites. My immortality does not mean I don't feel pain. I certainly do. And when my body parts were finally reassembled and life was poured back into me, it hurt like hell's nipple rings. When I came to, it was the middle of the night and I could not see a thing. The milky glow of the insects illuminating the bottom of the oil drum, and a shy moon were my only light. The insects seemed to play a simple tune, a high-pitched but not unpleasant sound, like a bowed saw on helium. I started thinking about Ethelween. I did not know where she was or the full details of what had happened on that extremely disagreeable night down on the docks. These little sprites that covered my wounded body had often been her way of helping me. I imagined she was up late in the grotto weaving some kind of elaborate spell that would redress the balance of everything. I started to use my hands the next day when the sun came up and I began paddling a little, belly down on the oil drum. The vast ocean seemed a blur. I was high on insect milk and getting bad vibes. Then something under the oil drum began to grab me. I was shocked to find it was an octopus of some size. I did have some affinity with the beast, one of Ethelween's legs, after all, was an octopus tentacle. I got used to the gentle push, and I let it guide me. As the waves softly sang, time seemed to pass more rapidly, with the creature leading me to shore. I had no idea what time it was, what day it was, where or who I was. But I was completely naked so I had to keep a low profile as I clambered along a soggy jetty in a little fishing village. Then I noticed a mailbag with the words Costa Rica. So that's where I was. 
Then I decided I could clothe myself with the mail bag, and I climbed inside. It was a big mistake. The mail bag was quickly tied up and put into the back of a van and taken to a loud sorting office. Before long, I was in the back of an aeroplane flying to New York, still in the bag. Although it was a very uncomfortable journey, it felt like fate was throwing an interesting hand on the poker table of my life yet again. At least I didn't have to pay for a ticket, and the insects, with their harrowing tunes, kept me amused. They were very good at getting scraps of food from the main cabin, and they kept me alive. They even clothed me, stealing an ill-fitting suit from the suitcases stacked around us. When we arrived in JFK Airport, people were shocked when a fully clothed man dropped through the hatch onto the conveyor belt with the rest of the baggage. "'Hey, wait a minute, that's my suit!' shouted a tourist. I had to think on my feet. "'What the hell's that?' I said as the insects disappeared through an air vent. The bright lights of my tiny friends distracted the people enough for me to make a run for it. And that was the last I saw of the little chaps for a while. I was now fully regenerated. So it was time for them to return to the enchanted well on the marshlands. I had to adventure on, alone. Sits the crow atop the tall cross. Upon the hill behind, the tower hangs headless, vanishing into the mist. A bell, a toll, a knell, a spell, fills a lull in the traffic, kirkyard gothic. Sheltering, smoking in this shooting gallery of graves, by the iron infected sharps bin. The sharp end of heroin. Poppies of remembrance are wreathed around the obelisk. Stone needle permanence, HIV infection risk. Poppies of remembrance, poppies of oblivion. Papaver somniliferum, mementos of Afghanistan. The snow at first glance seemed pristine. At second glance, it was seen flurry after flurry had buried the previous scenes. A bell, a toll, a knell, a spell fills a lull in the traffic. Kirkyard Gothic. Mist condenses falls in drops from twiggy tipped extremities punching a doily in the snow around the kirkyard cherry tree a ring of spring of dark and light a grey 
of green and white, a thawing morning warming start around the ivied cherry heart. Life drips, love drips, tears of mist of love go to the lost, belief and addiction grip, which is least and which is most, mist drips down towards the dead, while grief lives in the living. Snowblind sap wakes within this haloed ring of spring. Hope drips, love drips, life and death grip yet sheer apart. This slowly warming, thawing start, bleeding from the cherry hearts.
Okay, thanks everybody who uh, who tuned into that there. That was uh, Fuzzback Gigs podcast episode number two with special guests Paul Vickers and uh, much of Paul Vickers and the Leg. Paul Vickers and the Leg are normally completed by uh, Pete Harvey, Alan Scurlock, and more recently uh, John Mackey and James Metcalf. On the next episode of the podcast, our special guest will be Bell Wongs. Very much looking forward to that one. Uh, that should be quite good. Um, yeah, so everyone, uh, please stay safe. Please look after yourselves. Uh, wash your hands. And yeah, cheers for now then. Uh, bye-bye. Have a good rest of your evening.